Support for Zap to the Past is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Their products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 4 million satisfied men worldwide who can trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. That's 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code ZAPT20. That's Z A P P E D 2 0 at manscaped.com. Now, if my maths is correct, that's about 8 million balls. And welcome to episode 75 of Zapped to the Past. I am Adrian Mills and I'm joined as always in this stupid, stupid heat by Graham Raddings. If you haven't listened before, this is a podcast where we discuss the weather because it's damned hot. Uh, no, sorry, games that were released for the Commodore 64. Last week, we looked at our third batch of games from issue 33 of Zap 64, which we are in no way affiliated with and were satisfied by Skate or Die, meandered through the maudlin mean streak and we armoured up in Airborne Ranger. This week, we conclude our look at the games in January 88, along with what was lighting up our cinema screens that month. So, Graham, tell us what we have going on in this episode. In this last Sunday of the month car boot sale, featuring a woman selling homemade soaps that smell of cranberry and despair, a man selling used chip pans and paraffin wax, two stalls selling dubious-looking personal lubricants named Easy Slide and Never Grip, and a young couple selling miniature models of factories that make miniature models of an episode. We head into the filthy, dirty labs of an 8-bit bioengineering facility looking for disinfectants in the outright grubby spore, grab our Stetsons, kick our spurs and check for snakes in our boots before enjoying a few rounds of competitive spitting and more in the oddball western games head to the planet orb to launch an election campaign by throwing and smacking our balls around in uh, mad balls and zoom across yet another checkerboard landscape this time avoiding a whole load of rocks in the nippy chromosome if the tungsten toothpick mixed bag of hosepipe connectors and questionless trivial pursuit game for two quid hasn't quite hit your giddy bargain button and you're now side-eyeing the royal family toby jug collection on the stall next door we use the force switch off our targeting computers and head into the jerky 8-bit vector trenches of the death star in the somewhat late arcade conversion of star wars try and find a reason to load and enjoy the plotless play school animated skid mark of a game more than once with sky twice assume our massive monster alter egos and take to the samey cities bashing down 8-bit build in the decidedly dull Rampage, explore yet another boring brown BBC-based maze game with the mappy happy Zor before finally heading to home base for a new lawnmower, table lamps and laser weapons and then upgrading our skimmer for some serious side-scrolling alien murder in the rewarding Risk. The bag is still mixed, the hits are still occasionally missing and we are still finding some rotten apples. But now and again, the odd little gem pokes its way through the 8-bit underpants. Nice. Super. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm a feared. There might be something in here. It might be under camouflage. <laughs> Who knows? Who dares to dream? <laughs> that was brilliant, Billy. Thank you, Billy, for that uh, trip down memory lane. <laughs> Absolutely. Is he here all week? <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> we can't get rid of him. Until he gets on a log and chops himself open. He's all, it's, uh... Absolutely. In the, one of the worst uh, yeah, yeah. Fi- final stands ever. <laughs> yeah, we'll po- talk about that most, later. The most pointless, yeah. yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll, we'll, yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. We have... Yes. A, a, as, uh, yeah, so it may be a predatorial cinema. So is, the, is this the final batch of games? It is the final batch from January, isn't it? Thank God. Mm-hmm. It's it been is, endless. Yeah, it felt endless this January. It's gone forever. Well, February does. March does. These are long, long, lots of games. 101 in the first three months. Holy guacamole. I know. Seems so long ago since we talked about that Dolph Lundgren in the snow. Do you know, it, it is. And I was thinking, I noticed, by the way, that on our uh, Twitter, we had some, we've had some interesting Twittery stuff. I, I don't normally bring it up, but there's been some interesting Twittery stuff. I've, I was 
was actually soundbited, which is kind of exciting. Oh, That's yeah, never happened to me that. before. <laughs> you were. So, so, someone soundbited me. Nostalgia goggles. Was it uh, Lions from Nostalgia goggles? Soundbited me. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with that. I stand and I stand by my. Um, <laughs> you stand by your. Criticism. I wondered what game it was about. You talking was, about? Um, it was the Jack uh, the Disney one. No, no, it was, it was, was no, that? I thought it was the Nipper Disney one. Yeah, it was Jack the Nipper 2. Uh, well, that is brown, but it's it's the same game as that bloody Disney one, isn't it? So uh, the mouse one, what was it called? Sherlock Mouse, or whatever it was called. Basil, Basil the Great Mouse. Basil detective. the Great Mouse, yeah, that's the one, Sherlock Mouse, yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. So, yeah but so, I, sta- so, I stand by it, yeah, it was it's, turd. Yeah. It's always nice to get quoted uh, that you think it all looks like It surprised like me, yes. It was just, there was a lot of turd in that uh, <laughs> so, short segment. It's, we've come a long way since we started. We used to do warnings about the potential profanity. There might be a couple of odd ones slipped through. Turd, turd, turd. The game was turd. I'm like, all right. Maybe I need to gate that a bit, but... Uh, I stand by it. Turd's, stand not, by turd's it. not a rude word. It is a bodily function. Well, it's a bodily produce. <laughs> Alcohol's not a drug. It's a drink. <laughs> and we've proved it in tests. <laughs> exactly. Don't worry about it. Don't worry your poor little ears. Anyway, yes, anyway, thank you to, uh, was it Nostalgia Goggles? Dave Lyons, wasn't it? It was uh, those it was. that uh, brought that to our attention. Thank you for that trip down memory <laughs> lane. Because to, to be fair, once we've recorded, I kind of forget all these things. I know. Well, it's, if it's fire and forget. Like, uh, you know, that's how we operate. Yeah. But, uh, it's like someone called us out for our uh, beatboxing for combat school. I'm like, I saw that. I, I saw that something about and that. And then I listened to it and yeah, it was terrible. And we did. Well, <laughs> it, it was, it, we weren't really beatboxing. It was, we were actually impersonating the erratic drum sounds. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think it was an accurate representation. Yeah, to say was it was what, beatboxing, there would be a, a stretch. It was. That was one of our patrons, wasn't it? J Dove. It was. J Dove. J Dove, yeah. the patron, said, uh, great beatboxing. I'm like, nah. Okay. I've actually <laughs> seen one. them. I've actually, I went to see um, Beardy Man in Liverpool. You talk about great beatboxers. I went to see Beardy Man in Liverpool. Does he, he did a bit of beatboxing and as well as other stuff anyway. Really cool. You're just saying words at me now. You're you've saying words of, that I don't, I don't you've understand. You've heard of Beardy. You must have heard of Beardy Man. He's famous for having a beard and he's a man. <laughs> He's <laughs> brother, brother to must, must that boy. He does exactly what he says on the tin. <laughs> go to go, e lad. Anyway, to uh, to all of our patrons who are amazing, and also to our people on Twitter, that's uh, awarding a bit. <laughs> that's a Billy laugh for them. Uh, well, that's, that's the <laughs> three Billy laughs full. <laughs> Anyway, on with the uh, on with the crazy. We've got plenty to get through. We have. We've got lots of games and lots of stuff. Should we get into the first one? Draw I think that. it's probably. I think it's time. I think it is. And Graham, you've got this. It's a budget title. It's a big old score. This one, ninety-seven percent. This is. is Spore. Now, just before you get into this, actually, I've, I've noticed that all the games. Um, in this first section, can can be replaced into um, songs. So for Spore, I thought of Spore, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> um, so you'll see as we go through these first four, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, I'll yeah, I'm looking forward to songs. it. So Spore, <laughs> Ugh, good God, y'all. What is it good, good for? for? Absolutely. 97%, oh yeah. Is that silver medal or is that 97%? I thought that was gold medal territory. It's because but... it's in the budget category. You can ah, only so get budget, a silver medal. So budget games aren't allowed to get gold. Precious Not anymore, gold. no. No, they're silver Honestly, medals. Absolutely. That's two fingers up to the designers. Anyway, let me anyway, uh, let me, let me wax lyrical sport. about it. Let me tell you about sports. Not No relation to the later game of Spore that came out on PC and all that lot. Very popular, no. that. No. This is copyright Mastertronic. Bulldog Software made this. Good old Bulldog. Do you remember them? Apparently, it's coded by Jim Baguli, but it was not coded by Jim Baguli, apparently. <gasps> That's a ruse. It's a Fugazi, a Fugazi. It's, it doesn't exist. It's a myth. It doesn't happen because there's like ruminations and stuff about that. Anyway, we'll come to all that. Is Jim Baguli was, a real person, then? I, well, I, I think he is, but I don't think he'd had anything, anything to do with this game. I think they just attributed it to him for reasons unknown. Got his like name he, on the title screen, right? Well, yeah, he's from LV426, for reasons unknown. <laughs> um, the music is definitely by Dave Whittaker. You can tell because it's about 38 seconds long, anyway. <laughs> um, so this is actually, there's a, I'll, I'll go over the sort of commentary that's in Lemon64. There's some stuff about it on games that weren't. There's a bit of brouhaha about the whole <gasps> thing. Brouhaha. Um, because it's actually, and I genuinely believe it was actually programmed and coded by somebody called Paul Rogers, who later coded Double Dragon 3, the Rosetta Stone, Time Soldiers, and Swiv. Anyway, enough of that. So anyway, we'll come back to that bit. A bioengineering facility of some kind has become overwhelmed with dirty, genetically modified spores. Uh. <laughs> spores. <laughs> All over the place. Spores. Itchy, dirty, smelly spores. <laughs> They're everywhere. And I hate them. I hate them forever. Anyway, filthy, dirty is. Uh, dirty, horrible place. Um, mm. 
if dirty, left, dirty boy. Um, if left to have fifty shades of grey spore sex, they will multiply beyond the facility and take over the damn world. That isn't good. Nobody wants a spore world apart from the spores. No. Anyway, no. the only detergent slash pesticide slash anti-spore lotion that can get rid of them is stored in barrels and strewn throughout the facility, the bioengineering facility. Strewn, Adrian, strewn. Mm, strewn. So someone, let's say you, needs to go in and extract, collect the barrels of anti-spore stuff. Okay. So you're inside a mini craft that can fly and shoot in all directions. The situation inside the facility is grim. Not only are there spores everywhere which you must shoot, but spore generators that pump out more spores than a teenager in a gym sock. Ew. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> yeah, <that> ain't nice. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> you said about putting warnings on. <laughs> Put one there, for God's sake. <laughs> that, that, don't worry, well. Each level is a single laboratory screen maze like affair through which you must navigate around and collect the barrels, obviously. To do, if you do that and you collect them off that screen, then it's on to the next laboratory and more barrel collecting. If only, Adrian, it were that simple. Mm. Some parts of the labs are sectioned off by laser walls, which can be switched on and off by shooting the blue generator block, or you can redirect them by shooting at the laser reflectors. You can blast the little earth blocks away too, if that's required, but the spores can also eat those and that will allow them to get to you and they will aim for you. So you've got to watch out for that. Of course, there's loads of spores already in the lab. They're everywhere, often held back by the laser walls. So if you start moving them around, they're going to come for you and the fact they'll flood towards you, draining your precious liquid and life away and your energy. Um, so you've got to be careful. You've got to tackle them. Indeed, unlocking areas and blasting your way through might seem like a good idea in this game, but you'll be quickly drained of life. And if you are, it's game over and you're more spore than spaceship after that. Mm. Uh, there are some items in the lab to help you. Energy canisters and anti-spore pills. Somebody should have perhaps just created a few more of them. Uh, so it's a race mm. to get the barrels, avoid, kill the spores and their generators before you are dead. That's the game. It's played down in a top-down view, obviously very akin to a gauntlet type of game. Indeed, I thought this is really a kind of a non-scrolling, single-screen gauntlet variant. Think you're of not, gauntlet. You're not wrong. Think of gauntlet if you played it from five miles above the dungeon, and you probably wouldn't be far off. Though tiny, the graphics are okay, pretty good. It's very simple. It's quite colourful, and you move around at a decent pace, and you shoot at all the different directions and, directions and stuff. Each lab is quite well designed in the sense that it's a puzzle. So there are some interesting puzzles, and it's actually pretty much load and go. There's no steep learning curve to it. Anyone familiar? with this kind of kind of gauntlet-esque dungeon crawly type space lab biospore crawly thing you're not going to take too long to get into it the sounding music was reasonable the usual Dave Whittaker fare I think not offensive to the ear but probably very forgettable because of its 30 second repetitive nature it all plays well and it's pretty responsive and there's some good frantic style action I suppose if you get to it and I quite like that single I that single screen idea I think that's quite a good thing I think it made you focus on it as more of a puzzle game and less of a kind of dungeon crawly gauntlet type thing even though it kind of is that. Um, it even has its own screen designer, which I did have a little go on, but didn't find to be very good. But you can save and load your own dungeons, dungeons, your own labs and things like that. It's a nice touch, considering this is a summary total of £1.99 for the game, really. So with that and, you know, the, the basic gameplay and the simplicity of it all, it pumps up the value for the money, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Pump up the value. It's all <laughs> good. For two quid, I thought it was a good little budget game. Obviously very inspired by that gauntlet idea. Some nice touches in here. I quite enjoyed playing it. Got a bit samey, but pff, for two quid, it's probably actually a little bit more fun, a little bit more focused than Gauntlet was. Um, and it's quite a good value budget game, all in all. Now, to the controversy, very quickly. Comment in Lemon says this, written many years ago by my fair hand, this is comment written by Paul Rogers, um, and not this Jim Baguli person, 100% my design, graphics, code and music, written in two weeks after seeing Game of Life on Horizon or something like that. Sold to Mastertronic by a friend for £1,500, of which he took 500 Ah, well, many, many lessons learned from the, with this game. At least it was a bit of fun. Just annoying that I got zero credit at the time, probably still got the source code in a box in the garage. And in fact, um, there's actually a sequel to this that was written. I don't know if it was ever released. I think it was called Mutant Zone. And there's an entire page about this and Paul Rogers' claims and everything else on the games that weren't. Um, so there is kind of a strand and there's a bit of a demo. There's even a downloadable thing, a downloadable demo of Mutant Zone. I think you can download and play as is the way with the amazing games that weren't website. So it sounds like there's a little bit of friction, you know, a little bit of 50-50 uh, mm. going on. I would, looking at Mutant Zone, I don't know if you downloaded it, I'd look, I had a quick look. I didn't know. And it, you could sort of see the lineage of uh, Spore 
in mutant zone. So I don't, I don't think there's any doubt that Paul Rogers programmed this. So why it was attributed to Bill, uh, Bill, uh, attributed to um, Jim Baguli and all of that, I don't know. And it's not my business really. Um, but it's an interesting footnote for a game that is silver medaled, 97%, which is a bit high for what it is, but it is budget. But I still think it's a little bit crazy high. But I know time with it, I suppose. I'm, I quite like this gauntlet type stuff, but I, it's too quick. It's a two quid gauntlet. It's Aldi gauntlet and in a kind of a space setting. So I suppose it was all right. about you? Uh, yeah, I thought this was a very uh, clever character-based gauntlet style game that I thought manages the mobs and hordes far better than any of the sprite burst version, sprite based versions we've had so far. Um, it, it's fast. It's a simple premise. Collect the blue canisters off each screen to progress to the next. And it's it, and this is made both challenging and compulsive by the ability to attack the screen with a multitude of different strategies based on the ability to turn the laser fences off as you see fit, uh, redirect them and all that kind of thing. So I thought this was really clever because, because there's multiple ways of trying to approach the screen and how you manage the hordes of spore. Um, and that's quite good. I thought this lent it, each screen a variety of different ways of completing them. And you can split the approach. You can between speed running to get to the next screen or you can high score chase by letting the spores keep coming to rack up points at the cost of energy that is constantly running out. So a nice risk reward depends how you want to play it. And I thought that's quite a nice way to approach this and, and shows that this is well a well designed, yeah, you, you're right, it's gauntlet from you know a high distance, but there's nothing wrong with that. And I think the um, the way that this works, and obviously it shows its other routes, it's on the C16, it's on loads of other consoles as well, uh, uh, computers as well. And if you couple that with a comprehensive screen editor, you know, you, you actually have to draw everything on it. So it's a bit weird. I would really like these screen editors to be joystick controlled, but hey ho, it is what it is. You take what you've got. This is a great buy. I think this would be a good buy at full price, let alone two quid. Um, I think it's a really clever and well-designed game. It plays fast, it's responsive, and it's chaotic um, all at the same time. And most of the time, um, you only have yourself to blame for freeing the hordes that spell your de- you know, your demise. So it- it's one of those games where you've got to stop for a moment and just plan, where am I shooting? What am I doing? What do I need to blast? If I blast that, oh no, I blasted the wrong thing. Hordes of spore is coming at me. Leg it quickly, you're trying to clear out a path. We're trying to get him down a narrow alleyway so you can take them all out. The shooting's fast, which is always a good thing to see. We've been moaned games where you don't shoot fast enough to actually destroy the horse. Yeah, it's nippy, isn't it? Yeah, it but in this, nippy. you do, and, and you know, uh, you only have one bullet on screen at a time, but because the, it spawns immediately, the other one's dying. So, I think, so that's good. It, 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 this feels good. I thought this was an excellent addition to our budget wonders category, which we've got a, a number yes. of in there. Yes, um, that's true. I would true. put this up there. 97% is high. I, I give it that. But I think for two quid, for the level of design, the speed at which this plays, the, the you know the ability to not just play the normal modes but also play normal modes and your own creations in the same game and also play your own and design your own i thought this you know that's, that's quite a quite a decent buy it's what we said about kickstart too really i think this is clever i thought this was really good i'd never heard of it before and certainly never played it, it didn't never cross um my radar back then but this was a nice surprise and going going to it was i wasn't sure what to expect it took me a couple of goes just to sort of get my head around the, the the concept and and stuff but once i did i was playing this for quite a while trying to get through quite a few screens the, the power-ups are nice to see you know it's getting your energy but also you know not just knowing when to use the spore what, what's it called again the spore reflectors whatever they're called they're getting rid of them so it makes all the spore run away from you is really handy is when you're going for those last few um last few canisters and stuff on a screen yeah, i thought this was great spore what a what, what a was a pleasant surprise to um to start the episode with oh good. bad yeah i was in, i was impressed with this nice Nice, nice game. Yeah. Anything else you want to add no, on that? No, 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 no. I, I, I was playing it for quite a while actually. It surprised yeah. me. I don't normally. I, I do normally like gauntlet games. I don't like tend to like games with really tiny sprites, well, really tiny characters, whatever. But this one, it does kind of work because the franticness kind of comes across, and you are kind of diving about a bit. And you, but you do have to think about where you're going to open those laser walls and stuff. It's, yeah, it's a absolutely. nice little game. That for two quid, it's a bargain, really. Yeah. Spore. What was it good for? Quite a lot, actually. Absolutely. For two quid, it's good for everything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah we approve. Spore. Good game nice one to start with let's move on i'm sure the next one will be just as good yeah (laughs) and so our next one is in the western games and deadwood world the eastern (laughs) games are never played (laughs) western (laughs) games Western games. I would pay good money to see Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe in the Western. <laughs> Finish, the mil- please end mil- that sentence. Milking a cow. <laughs> Thank God you ended it that. <laughs> 
there that, you go. That could, have, that could have taken all sorts of directions. Oh, we Western games. Western games. Western, the Western games. games. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be humming that for bloody days now. Well done. <laughs> You're welcome. Earworm. There's, there's more to come. Oh, <laughs> there's more Lord. to come. Uh, anyway, Western games, what's all this about? We've had the alternative world games in this very issue. We and have. now we go all the way back to the Wild West for the Western games. So we all know the Wild West <laughs> with its cast of comedy characters, you know, like Billy the Kid, well, Bill Hickok. Hey, <laughs> good luck. Yeah, murderous, uh, murderous, <laughs> dangerous uh, robbers and rapists. Absolutely. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. You know, it's rife with crazy pastimes ready to be lampooned in a hilarious ensemble package, complete with crap controls and overly long games that far outstay their welcome. Oh, they can, they won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> they won't. They can't go away. Uh, yes, Western games may look the part, but how D certainly doesn't play it. <laughs> <laughs> Insert. <laughs> Western-based <laughs> pun here. Uh, anyway, this is brought to you by a whole posse of people. <laughs> oh, good with, God. With, with Ralph LeCamper being the main designer and doing some code and audio. The coders were Oliver Rauch, Axel Valsleben, Vassle, Vassle, sorry, Frank Hartman, Hjorg, Hjorg Prenzing, Ulrich Schultz, Gerald Bellow, Holger Krekel and Holger Gehrman. Graphics were, graphics were by Bettina Wiedner and Hartwig Niedergassel. And sounds were by Arno Schroeder and Olaf Hartmann. They all sound like thoroughbred Texans. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the Germans of, uh, of Austin are well known. <laughs> the, the Bjorg Prenzings. Yeah, I think this is originally made in for Germany somehow. And, this, and it was. And the six events it contained were Armdrucken, Tanzen, Primspucken, Bierscheisen, Kummelkan, and Vettersen. Just so you Bierscheisen, know. Bierschitten. <laughs> Don't know. Uh, translated, they are arm wrestling, dancing, quid spitting, beer glass shooting, cow milking, and eating. <laughs> I love that last one. Eating. <laughs> Just, Just eating. eating. Not, is that an event? Really? <laughs> Just eating. Uh, the team that developed this are called Magic Bites, uh, but it was released over here via Areola Soft, our, fam- our nipple favorite soft. N- nipple-based uh, re- release uh, developers or uh, publishers. Anyway, right, so what, what's Western Games all about? The title screen to this is usual kind of thing in these multi-event games. You can have one or two players. You can choose joystick or keyboard for either player, and then you can choose to compete in all six events or maybe just one at a time. Once you've chosen what you want, you get to enter your name, uh, and this is quite nice. You you choose a letter and it shoots it onto a piece of wood. You select the letters. I thought it was quite a nice touch. So uh, I thought good. it was monotonous and drove me crazy. So slow. It was slow, but you know, it takes a while to to spell out a big name in bullets. <laughs> so exactly. It's, so, but it's just getting you prepared for what's to come. Yeah, Melvin Rubenstein the <laughs> third was still clicking his bloody joystick. <laughs> True. Uh, and then we're into the games, right? Arm wrestling's first up. First thing you notice is the colourful and well-drawn visuals. Uh, they are by far the best thing about this game, being cartoonish and featuring some nice animation throughout, even if most of the scene that you see is still. So it's got this kind of, it's a view, that this arm wrestling is seen from a kind of over your shoulder. So there's a couple of characters at a table. You're the one nearest the camera and there's another guy facing you. There's lots of, you know, Western comedy cartoonish mm. characters dotted around and they sort of start Looking and there's on. some stuff. Yeah. So when you start, okay. So I, uh, and a, so across the top of the screen in arm wrestling, under you know they've got the big gold graphic. The main most of the screen's taking up this big graphic. There's no scrolling or anything. It's just this big graphic. Two characters. You're arm wrestling at the top of the screen. There's three boxes, um, and they have arms in them. There's a picture of an arm in each one, just sort of laid out. When you start the when you start the middle box with the arm in, will f- start to flex upwards from the elbow like a like sort of you know an arm curl and it's your job to pull the joystick down when the arm is in a strong position i didn't really understand what that meant what's a strong position mm. is that full I think curled? flexed i think fully flexed, curled yeah. or out is that whatever um if you do this right your arm which is re- represented in the left box if you're in a single player, it will start to slowly flex upwards and so forth. If you keep pulling down at the right time, you'll gain more strength. You'll flex more and more. And this eventually translates into you pulling your opponent's arm down in the main window where the cartoony action is taking place. That's it. You've just got to essentially just get keep your arm flexed by it's a rhythmic thing essentially you're just pulling down that's it that's the that's your control i don't quite know why this is supposed to represent our wrestling but hey ho and you repeat this if you win you you win one of them and it's best of five wins although it, i didn't find that actually because it just wouldn't stop at one point um oh, I, no. I was three i was three one up and it still kept going and it's got three two and it still kept going i was like I've won. Don't don't cheat me out of my win. Um, yeah, so that's arm wrestling. It's boring. Next up is beer glass shooting. Oh, God. Two people stand in front of a bar holding glasses. 
um, of, the, of the ever decreasing sizes. So they start with like big, big pots and it goes down to sort of shot glasses. And you must draw your gun by moving right when the ca- one of the characters on the left says draw or whatever. Um, and then you, you've got a crosshair that suddenly appears and you've got to aim your crosshair at the glass and you press fire to shoot. That's it, really. To win this round, you need to score five hits in a row on your glass without your opponent getting any shots of their own in. <clears throat> Because if they do, the score is reset and you need to try to get five again. Or they do. So I found this one incredibly easy for it to go on forever. Endless. Forever. Just forever. Like, you get to about three and then they'd get one. You'd be like, oh. They'd get to two, you'd get one. Oh. It just went on forever. There's no need for this. No need. It just goes on and on and on. <clears throat> So that's that one. If you manage to get past that, or you know, you don't reset your sixty-four. Because the other thing is as well, there's no quitting. <laughs> there's no option there to ain't. quit once you're in a game. You're in. You're in for good. Anyway, we're next on to quid spitting. It's basically spittoon. It's you know, it's that chewing tobacco stuff in it. I think. So, yeah, spitting. Yeah, spitting. Yeah. So, so this one, we see a side-on view of our competitors with a jug at their feet. The point of this is to chew the quid and then spit it into the jug at the feet of the opponent. So keep, bear with me with these controls. The point you do this by pushing up to bite the quid where you waggle to chew you push forward again to stop chewing you pull down to determine the angle of spit then you press fire and let go to spit (sighs) good lord first of three wins in this one it's so ridiculously hard to manage those controls they're so unresponsive you never seem to know what's going on there's just spit dribbling i just had spit dribbling out my gob at the time crappy crappy it was not very good dancing's up next and you must follow a complex set of moves that are demonstrated to you on stage by a burlesque can-can style girl she'll do it first like yep. and there's a guy playing playing a pinkling on the piano um and there's a couple of couple of guys in the audience and you've got to sort of please them should you get it wrong so as, as you and you will you will get this wrong because because following these the instructions is a nightmare you've got to buy the pianist a drink to have another go you only have three drinks and then it's game over and whoever did the best wins is what i think happens this one doesn't go on forever but it still takes a bloody long time to go in between each phase because it won't be you that wins not ever i couldn't do anything uh, every loser does not win remember no milking the cow is up next and again you must rotate the joystick so pretty in a like weird the way. Thing. You, yeah, I think in a series of directions in time to a pulsing udder. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Not, yeah, that's not a sentence I ever thought I would be saying. Not ever. Waggling never my something joystick. I thought I'd be doing. Waggling my joystick in a series of directions in time to a pulsing udder. Sounds weird. The instructions You've for done this that are not. Before. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you pulsed have. your udder. <laughs> <laughs> the instructions for this are not clear. <laughs> and I got not one drop of milk from my cow, which looked none too happy at my ineffectual squeezing of its teats. Um, <laughs> finally, we have the... <laughs> finally, we have the eating. <laughs> which is like spitting. And then you must pull down to lower the spoon into the food, waggle it to bring it to your mouth. You got pull down to slurp it in, waggle to chew, and then push down with fire button to swallow. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Stupid. If all this sounds overly complex, because it is, it really is. Whilst the game looks very nice, it's got detailed visuals across all aspects and some nice music as well in spots. The playing of this game is horrible in every way. Nothing makes sense. There's no real immediate feedback to anything you're doing. The wobbly crosshair of the shooting is a pain. The rhythm sections do not seem to respond to anything you're doing eating and spitting are a complicated nightmare of unintuitive actions and nothing responds like you want it to the game's gone for ages as well far longer than you want them to there's no way to quit as i said once you've started so you've got to play through to completion on each one and in the case of the shooting it can go on forever if you keep interrupting each other's runs why was this developed these controls i'll never know there's obviously some talent in the visual and audio department and you know code it all works it's well presented and thought out it just seems no one played these events beyond the developers has anyone testing it would have just said no 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 this does not work and these instructions to rubbish write them again and make them clearer make it simpler and clearer in how to play a novel idea is not enough to warrant playing a game when the underlying gameplay is as bad as this this one like old yeller needs taking out round back and shooting in the head it's the kindest type of mercy for something like this how did you get on with the old western games well pretty much the same as you actually uh what a strange idea a game with milking in it ew it's all <laughs> a bit weird that it's just at some point somebody said that to somebody it was like let's have a milking event and they all went yeah let's do that yeah weird <laughs> yeah uh, so another quirky compilation you know game from the 
town of quirky in compilation land. This time, as you say, the Wild West is lampooned and with the added complication of satanic controls. Um, that's always a fun <laughs> thing to do, isn't it? I thought the Wild West was meant to be a simple place with sim- simpler times and simple yeah, things. so and did I. No, not so. Graphics generally on the whole were all good. Audio was okay. Music was quite stirring. It wasn't very westerny, though, was it? That opening title music, wasn't Not it? Really. Wasn't what you call Wild West. Um, so graphically, you know, you, you're going to be content. But each event controls like a, a, a greased pig, really. Um, <laughs> just to put it in contextual. So <laughs> I think right from the get go, entering your name one letter at a time with a joystick was slow and dull, and that paved the way for what was going to come. Because I was trying to put my name in, and I got bored doing it, and I thought I've got a feeling this is going to be a, a theme here. Oh yeah, by the second go, I was just A. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was just. <laughs> A, a B um, and uh, you know nice idea just you know it needs to be quick really or keyboard controlled you know that's what that's why you have a keyboard built into the damn machine so you can press letters <laughs> anyway um so and the way the game plays out makes no sense whatsoever does it in terms of how you control the events like you say the arm wrestling oh look nice but the idea of r- rhythmically pumping downwards on a bicep control and propping your arm with the fire button with the st- where your strength is indicated by pulsing muscles it's all a bit I don't know there's something not quite right about it. <laughs> Um, and that downward sort of thing. See, I thought to myself, when I was playing the milking, I thought that actually would, surely that's actually more how you would control the milky one. So you would be pulling the joystick down and do it. Yes. So it's all a bit all over the place because the milky one, you have to go sort of top corner to bottom left-hand corner, up, across, down, back, up, down, up, and then diggy zaggies. No, what? What? Yes. What? No, what? Nobody wants to milk a cow like that. Even cows don't want to be milked like that. They're like, <laughs> no. if you've been playing that Western games, because you know what? You can move on. <laughs> anyway, <Hey. laughs> I won't do a Billy laugh for that. I just, oh, I should do one. There we go. We'll have a little one. <laughs> anyway, so just you know, basically, most of the controls left this game down to timing and look. The timing being if you how long you could stand to play it for, or how long it was going to go on for, because it could go on forever, like you say. The look being that with any look at it, end it you know reasonably soon. It lacked any excitement and any drama, which I'd have thought something like a Western game would have been. If you think of Law of the West, where you've got, you know, shootouts and the mm-hmm. Western themed stuff, and then you've got this, where, you know, you're milking cows and just stupid stuff. I didn't like any of the events in this at all, the beer shooting, all of them, all of them, just stupid, mm-hmm. really stupid. So that was my, you know, my main issue with it was that every problem in the game was der- derived from its bad controls. The graphics on the whole aren't bad, but it's boring when you can't control something because you're like, well, I, just, I can't get it. I can't do it. Um, so it was clearly designed by someone, some people who had uh, never used a joystick or understood the term controlling. Um, you know in terms of a game so and also did you notice by the way add our least favorite thing in there so when it did end finally you got the yes no toggle it didn't just have a switch to yes which no it was like yes no yes no, yeah get that wrong and you're like no <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes i did notice that as well so it was just like that was the final uh you know that was the final knife to the german sausage for me um <laughs> so um it, as they say in, as they say in germany so milk to mankind q which means uh this is not how you milk cows it's not um, no no so, no it's not not good that not good at all got 68 percent, which is high for a game like that i know no nah, i thought it was utterly uncontrollable but good looking stupidity nonsense. yeah that's what i thought too not good not good no back to the old west with you western games we want no yes. more of your western uh, cowboy games shen- <laughs> 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 no more of your cowboy <laughs> shenanigans let's move no. on to our next one Because our next one is Mad Balls, stick together, never, never bad sad balls. Yes, that's good. I was, I was actually thinking more Duran Duran. Mad Balls, never yeah. losing. No, but anyway, yeah, but Mad Balls, all mad good. Mad Balls, do, do, never close your eyes. <laughs> mad Balls, do, do. <laughs> But if you say it too quick, it does like, like you sound like you're saying my mad balls. balls. <laughs> stick together. Mad Balls probably do stick together. They probably um, do. Not, however, if you uh, have made sure there's Sean using Manscaped <laughs> products. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd drop that in there. Anyway. Enough of that. Tell us about Mad Balls, Graham. So Mad Balls, the developer of this was Denton Designs. Denton Designs. Den, 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 Denton Designs. Uh, <laughs> 
it has nothing to do with this. I started <laughs> this thing that. is driving us nuts. <laughs> it is. It's very warm. And the producer was DC Ward. I guess he's a policeman on the side. I don't know. And the musician was a PC Fred Gray. And so there you go. <laughs> uh, mad balls. What were they? Well, they were actually a series of foam ball toys created by Amtoy um, in the mid 80s. I don't really remember anything about the toys. I, remember, I think I've seen them on toy shop shelves like Toys R Us when it was around and stuff like that. Um, but apparently the balls incorporated a kind of gross out humour and each one was given a character synopsis and a really odd quirky name. Um, to give you an idea of how that played out, we'll talk about the names of the ones that are in the game, things like Dust Brain. <laughs> But there was one actually uh, that was missing from this game, which is called Brain Bash, which is a gory zombie head with partially exposed brain. However, it was originally named Crackhead, but they later renamed it to Brain Bash due to <laughs> unpleasant connotations uh, that may be, uh, that, may, that might be a thought, slang term I, for a drug user. I wonder what so. they could be. <laughs> I think they say, yeah, there's probably somebody who's got one of the uh, Crackhead mad balls on his shelf going, that's worth thousands, that is. That's yeah. Thousands, anyway. So the weird thing about this game, Adrian, is that everything I found underdescribed what you had to do, everything, including the actual inlay for the game. Mm-hmm. So the game inlay for the C64 says, Welcome to Orb, the craziest planet in the universe, once a normal, unassuming world, but since a freak cosmic storm, it has now become the home of the outrageous mad balls. They're gross, they're goofy, and they're mad. Power mad. Dust brain, skull face, slobulous, and a host of other crazy bouncing balloons are in a madcap race to rule the planet. Now you can join their wacky antics, bashing all contenders into submission in their quest for ultimate leadership. But in this zany world, expect the unexpected as many traps and barriers lie between you and your goal. Dustbins, oil slicks, fried eggs and crazy chickens are scattered around the landscape to aid or hinder your weird and wacky way to become boss mad ball it's wild it's weird it's bad it's mad it's mad balls they're busting loose that was the inlay from the tape now i ask you does that tell you how to play this game in any way no it does not no it doesn't no it doesn't of course it doesn't so the idea of the game you've got to become the top mad ball on the planet orb um and in doing so um score as many points as possible. The key to domination is to become the leader of the notorious gang of madballs who collectively control what passes for a parliament on this most unfortunate of planets. You play Dustbrain, and I've decided that none but your good self should rule from now on. To this end, you must convince the others that your own politics are ultimately the best. This is accomplished by smashing them into the goals and into your team or cabinet, or in the C64 version, tube. Once captured, their individual talents and idiosyncrasies can be used to help convince remaining doubters. The mad balls on your team can swap places by diving into the nearest open dustbin and when you have clicked all the rogue mad balls you can become the boss and have thus won. The fact that other mad balls have the same idea or are just plain mad and evil complicates matters and you'll soon notice for instance that all the other mad balls are out to kill you. There are balls un- indis- undistinguished bureaucrats whom everybody hates. If you kill one of these you just score points. Candidacy for boss mad ball is not for the squeamish. Gross is great. So that's the other blurb by the way. So that's the other blurb that's in some of the other versions. Still don't tell you how to play it, does it? Nope. Weird, isn't it? So mm-hmm. in the real world of the game, the actual game that you do play, you control a bouncing mad ball, a dust brain, which by the way, for the description is a mummy with rotting teeth and wrinkly teal skin. I thought that was unnervingly descriptive about the skin wrinkly (laughs) teal skin no no. anyway so you control it with a joystick and fire button across a series of scrolling platforms terrains on a quest to become the leader of orb to persuade the other mad balls that is screaming mimi slobulous skull face horn head freaky fullback swine sucker and fist face unfortunately named fist face um so they're the ones you've got to convince yeah you must find them on the various scrolling levels and platforms and then push slash bounce them off into the void below. When you do that, they will be collected in your tube at the bottom of the screen, and then you can find your way to the down tubes for another level. Once you're there, you'll have to navigate the train and seek out the next mad ball to add to your cabinet. The goal, of course, is to collect all the mad balls. Um, To make this more difficult than it needs to be, as it said in the very vague instructions, there are bureaucrat balls, which will constantly try to bounce you off the platforms, as well as the other mad balls. And if they succeed in pushing you off, the mad ball you are controlling will be freed slash released back into the game and will be and will be replaced by the next ball in your cabinet. Should you have any, if you don't have any captured mad balls, then your game is done. You only get one shot unless you've got more mad balls in your cabinet. Mm-hmm. Dotted around the platforms are open top dustbins. If you wish to swap your mad ball for one of your captured mad balls, you can do so by climbing in the dustbin and the first one in your cabinet tube will then be the one you control and the one you previously controlled will go back to the end of the land tube following so far Adrian because it's all fun this they're mad balls crazy zany mad balls each of the no. mad balls has their own speed, strength, and food preferences. So some are faster, some bounce higher. In addition to the bureaucrat balls, the terrain itself is difficult to traverse, as it as it is festooned with objects that can either hinder or help you, such as trampolines, spring balls, rubber tires, catapults, dustbins, open dustbins, ramps and pyramids, oil slicks and fried eggs, and mouse traps, which are instant death. Mm-hmm. Each mad ball has 
also has its own energy level. Did you know that? Indicated when in play by the rate of rotation of the barbershop pole, which connects the mad ball cabinet to the main game window. Like that would be the thing you would think of. (laughs) (laughs) This is really, really weird. Seems seems obvious to me. I don't know what your problem is, Graham. I mean, I was looking at the barb shop going, that's my energy meter. I can see that a mile off. <laughs> Each mad ball has its own food and consumption requirements. So that's fish heads, coke and melons. Careful with that, it's Coca-Cola. I don't mean the other kind. Uh, Cabbage. Bones, crack crackheads um, back. <laughs> you land on those. You land on those to eat them and gain more energy. The more energy you lose, the slower and more difficult you become to control. I think because I could never actually really see that happening. It didn't seem to happen when I was playing it anyway. Mm. So the game then that's essentially the how the game plays out. If you understand any of the controls and any of the varying different descriptions, the game is akin to Rebounder. Really, Bounder. It's kind of ish. The graphics yeah. of the background platforms are okay, with some reasonable terrain to navigate and some sort of half decent shaded graphics and pyramids and that kind of basically top-down view. There's a lot of brown and grey in this, quite a lot of that. It's obviously a tile-based game in some instances, but they scroll around in every direction in quite a sort of speedy, reasonable way. No real glitches there. Sprites are a problem because it's very difficult to identify what is or isn't a mad ball on the levels. And you've got no way of identifying the ones you should be looking for because it doesn't tell you. So you just got to assume that the one that looks not like the red and the blue one is probably the one you need to be going for, maybe. Yep. So it's a bit of a, collecting them is more luck than judgment, I thought. I just bumped into a couple completely by accident and they just fell in the void and like, yay, you got it. I'm like, oh, okay, right. Uh, <laughs> controlling them is a real pain because you bounce around, but the other, the animation is a bit rough and the whole thing feels really bitty. So it's not really smooth animation. A bit The, re- the bounder animation and the rebound was okay, the animation, the way it did it. Rebound slightly less so. This is kind of like they've taken frames of animation out. So it's a bit bitty and skippy. Um, and I didn't quite like that. The production for this feels a bit cheap the description and the instructions that i thought were genuinely vague because a lot of that stuff i've is not conveyed in the game that i've really and, and it's not obvious to what you'd have to do bouncing around the landscapes such as they are soon becomes very tiresome and there's very little payoff in changing mad ball as far as i could see some can go quicker some can bounce higher but in the end it doesn't seem to make a great deal of difference the minute you go to a level with a mad ball on you'll find them fairly, relatively quickly apart from the one that's crazy fast and then if you do that well it's going to be you're going to be in a different world and you're p- perpetually getting knocked off the edge of the things by the other bureaucrats balls anyway Mm -hmm. um so i don't know that i think that most of the mad balls i captured weren't actually that difficult to capture because i kind of did it by accident i don't think it would take you too long to complete this game completely by accident i don't think you'd ever really know what you were doing i think you just bump around and inevitably you'd just go oh right i've got them all wow um so from what i've read it's got a very disappointing ending anyway the music it has uh, you've completed it i guess i didn't complete it now i watched the playthrough on youtube all right the music is a fred gray piece which is jovial and forgetful at the same time sounds like a ben dalglish piece weirdly but it's not um because it's got that kind of tone that tone that kind of sort of anarchic tone to it that that is more familiar to ben daglish than fred gray otherwise it's a very dull game the loading screen was pretty shit as it goes as well and the title screen is just a scoreboard not a logo in sight that's terrible even the spectrum version had a logo in the title screen um yeah it feels like a project that had no passion um and a franchise that no one really cared about and it made in a time where dinosaurs are easily forgotten <laughs> I don't know why I thought I'd throw, throw it in. Just, I thought it was a completely forgettable game from a completely forgettable franchise. Weirdly, the franchise made a resurgence in the late noughties. The 2014, I think, there was a sudden... Remember Mad Balls? And then somebody obviously decided to release a load of Mad Balls again. But either way, didn't this, it won't help this game back in time. It was just a, 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 a you know a, a ball-y game that wasn't very good. So what about you? No, nah, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy this. It's an odd license. Strange. I don't, I'm not, I've got no... I have no real affinity with Mad Balls themselves. It's like some kind of... It's like, you know, a bounder knockoff that likes the charm and fun of that game in just about every way there are some nice touches i thought the parallax scrolling was well done you know the depth so the, the great yeah, thing that, so, all right. so it's all right the bouncing off chimneys and the, the sort of inertia that gives you felt felt okay but the gameplay is really dull and it, it pulls very very quickly wandering around trying to knock the chosen mad ball off the roof whilst being constantly bothered by the uh, bureaucrat who i would have thought would have wanted someone in charge because that's the yeah. that's the thing in it you know not attacking somebody who wants to be in charge mm. the bureaucrats want want to be you know want to be ordered around and told what to do these are mad ball bureaucrats they're crazy oh. they're zany they're wacky they're mad balls remember <laughs> Bad balls. Yeah, yeah, just very little in the way of fun or enjoyment. I didn't, I didn't like it. It's competent, but lacking any depth. And as you said, it's very brown. Each rooftop looks the same as well, with it the does, same yeah, colours. Yeah, yeah. And no, change the level colours, change it up a little bit, make different things, bounce on different roofs. And you don't even look like you're bouncing on roofs either. You look like you're bouncing on. I don't even know what you're bouncing on. If I'm perfectly honest, I don't know. It just gets old very fast. Not so much as mad balls as dull balls, and no one wants that. Um, just yeah. <laughs> I didn't like this from the moment it started. And like you said, 
have a title screen. Don't yeah, just give at me a, the very least. At the very least. I actually went and looked because I thought maybe the version we've got has not been cracked properly or whatever. And I sort of, I went and had a look around, downloaded about four or five other versions and they're all the same. Um, so no, no, that's just bad. It's just, you have a title screen. I have a title screen, not just a high score table. Well, the specy one to eight K had one because I checked and it did. Poor. Poor. That's what I say. No more mad balls. Sad, sad balls. balls. Yeah. They make my balls sad. Saggy balls. <laughs> I didn't want to go there. I didn't. I really didn't want to go there. But we did. We went there. (laughs) And let's move on quickly. Into our next one. Because I went through the chromosome. (laughs) God, you really have thought about this, haven't you? (laughs) Then when I take a ride into the the chromosome. chromosome. I had, to, I had to learn the guitar solo for Danger Zone um, because uh, and of a band I was in at, for a particular time. So I can actually play the guitar solo from well, the entire guitar piece, but particularly the guitar solo from that. Well it's good fun to play, but now I'm going to hear Chromosome whenever I play it. <laughs> I've ruined these songs for you. Chromosome. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, Chromosome. There you go. I told you, every so when I was playing these games, just these songs just appeared to me for every single one of the titles. <laughs> and I thought, there's a, there's a lucky coincidence. Well, because the games are that good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> My mind was elsewhere. It's the heat. This heat is driving me nuts. Chromosome is £2.99. It's from Mad Games. Mad Games. Mastertronics added dimension. It's got 72%. And it's got code, design, and visuals, I believe, by Kevin T. Green. Uh, music by David Dunn. Um, so this is, as I said, £3 of your Earth coins. And if I told you that Kevin T. Green also made Flash Gordon and had basically made the section we are chasing Ming the Merciless into a full game, would that surprise you? Yeah, it was eerily familiar. Very familiar, because that's pretty much what we have here. Yeah, it's tied up quite a lot, but anyway, it's, it's what we've got. So, in Chromazone, you are the pilot of a manta ray class space fighter. Except you're not in space. I don't know why, they, you know, why that is then. Anyway, um, you've been given the task of piloting this craft through the challenges of the Chroma Zone. Chroma Zone is spelled K R O M A zone by the way uh just so you know so only the best pilots survive this fearsome test so will you be the chromosome hotshot it sounds like you could almost be describing top gun as well <laughs> there you go see that's, what's, that's why it's all there it all plays out it's all it's all connected you know little things interconnecting moment to moment <laughs> let's play it anyway and find out the game's got a nice title screen i thought it's got a title screen so you know the, it's not brilliant it's, it's not a winner brilliant. so it's brilliant it's got it's got a little red chromosome it's got a logo you know it's not brilliant solid enough good logo so you know you couldn't really miss that F1 and F2 for starting the game no. in one or two play, could you, really? No, you couldn't miss what, that. What, what more do you need? do not need anything else. The, and a little squally message at the bottom saying uh, who's got the top score, which in the crack we had, is it Suzanne? Yeah, oh. Suzanne was the Suzanne top Suzanne was the, trade, the top she? scorer. I wonder who Suzanne was. Someone, so whoever did this crack. Um, Suzanne Vega. She's a mad player <laughs> at Chromosome. She's, she's a mad player. Uh, maybe. Anyway, quick jab on the fire button. We're into the game. Immediately, the visuals impress, I thought. Across the bottom is the UI. Um, with your health, the bonus you have yet to acquire, your score, and the high score. And now above this is a perspective grid, and your five lives are represented on it by little manta ray craft. This is all placed, and it's all placed on the, the dashboard of the manta ray ship you are in, which is silhouetted out against the oncoming checkerboard landscape. Um, so this looks really nice. It's a really nice, it's kept it very minimal uh, and color based. So it's all blue, uh, blue and black, which re- look, actually looks really quite nice, I thought. Um, the checkerboard landscape stretches off towards the horizon. You know, we saw it in Flash Gordon, we saw it in Cosmic Causeway. It's that kind of effect, that kind of look. Um, it looks similar to Flash Gordon. Um, it's vastly improved, though. Um, I had a look back at the Flash Gordon one. That's really simplistic in comparison to this in the distance is a quite a nice cityscape um you d- done in brown so sort of dark brown and light brown i thought it looked quite nice it looks uh, it's got a nice it's got slower parallax fashion of scrolling to it the speed you actually move across the checkerboard landscape and that looks it looks good visually this is really good as the game starts you'll be attacked from the sky a series of objects starts to approach you at speed and the aim in this first section is simply to avoid them they're like mines they're just coming at you in 3d essentially you just got to fly you know you you don't control your speed you just get get going and all you gotta do is go left and right um and avoid them that's it um collision with any of them loses you a life and one of your little manta rays on your grid will you know disappear and uh, if you lose all five it is game over at the end of this section you they speed up so you get this little sort of burst of speed thing which is really dead out of <laughs> and unwanted and unnecessary because it's just there seems to be these things coming at you loads of times you get through this though and we're on to the rest of the game 
and it's here where the main problem with the game lies, because beyond this point, it's all the same. By the checkerboard landscape switches from dark and light blue to dark and light red. So the second section, you unlock your guns, essentially, and like you did, in, and it controls exactly like it did in that Flash Gordon game. You're beset upon by waves of enemies who are trying to shoot you. You must destroy all the waves before you get the bonus, and then it's on to the next section. So it's essentially just now becomes a wave-based shooter. You just As enemies come towards you in 3D, sort of flying around, sort of Space Harrier style, you know, you've just basically got to shoot them. That's it. As in Flash Gordon's bike section, there's no crosshair, and there's no way of knowing where you are shooting. The only way you know is by shooting yourself and then you, you can get the height at which you are. Pulling up and down um, on your uh, on the joystick because you don't speed up or slow down. You just steer left and right. Pulling up and down raises or lowers your shots and obviously you can need to keep firing to sort of figure out the height at which you're, you're shooting so you can line them up with the aliens. Um, yeah, like I said, you don't don't control the speed. Your job is simply to always steer to void bullets and obstacles, then raise and lower the height of your shots, destroy wave after wave. That's it across an endless landscape. Uh, the visuals, as noted, are very good. There's an excellent sense of speed, and there's some really good sprite scaling as the objects moving in and out of the screen in a solid and believable manner. I thought were, the actual waves and the way they moved back and forth and were looped the looped, and I thought I thought that was really quite good. Some of the best I've seen, actually. I thought it was more impressive than what we saw in Space Harrier. Anyway, there's not that many of them. There's sprites, so there's sprite scaling, but it, they're, they're fast and, and everything's everything's good. The game's responsive to your commands so the left and right is good up and down as you shoot in it's fast it's good the sound effects are also well done and they fit the game well nothing annoyed me about this the issue though it's just a lack of variety. It feels odd that the first level is a dodging level and then it's never seen again. You just Every subsequent level is essentially the same mm. as far as I could see. And, and that kind of spoils it. If you had to add a little more variety, I don't know, I just, I'm just off the top of my head, a sl- you could have had a slalom stage where you've got to go through gates or whatever. Remember, this is a chromosome. It's a test. It's a yeah. testing facility. Giant squid. Giant squid for some science. A collection stage. You know, you could have had a boss or something. It's a testing facility. So why are there only two tests and one just goes on forever? I don't, I don't know. Because this game never ends. It just keeps going on. It would have been much better if there had been a variety of things for you to do and maybe you know it's that's down to its budget constraints maybe just develop these two i don't doubt that press repeat and that, that was it just dying to more sprites had them run through the sprite scaling system routine and that was that and okay. it wanes in interest after a few goes and you, you get to see all it has to offer it's a shame really it's not without its merits the challenge is decent but you'll tire of this quickly and wish it had some more depth to keep you coming back for more. Still, for three quid, it's technically very proficient. I thought it was really technically very good. I guess, you know, the Cosmic Causeway, probably, maybe it's up there um, and for three quid, but it's just not, it's lacking variety. It would sort have of entertained you probably on a Sunday afternoon if you bought this for three quid. So I'm not knocking it that much. And I, and I think it says something of what is actually there that I wanted more of it. So that, you know, not that I did want, I wanted less of it. I actually wanted more, more variety. There was more stuff to this. I think this would have been really excellent. Just doing that same thing over and over once you get past the dodging stage just a bit of a shame but that, that's what i thought of chromosome what about yourself yeah a nice uh speedy 3d checkerboard effect in that one there mm. quite a simple affair graphically it was all right not too bad simple st- simple title screen um is this a kind of a you know a refreshing new jo- budget genre the kind of zoom shooter i don't know anyway that's the mainstay of this it's quite simple zoom across the landscape avoid the rocks in level one like you say a bit of a dodgy level in more ways than one mm. and then obviously level two beyond you get your shooter thing and then it's just that um so it's just a bit limited in what you get which i get for a budget game i suppose the, U- the ui and everything graphically is all right nothing nothing amazing but it's you know, for, for a budget game it's pretty good you just don't get it doesn't give you a lot of info you don't get a lot of information from the game itself so it's you know it's budget constraints start to show a, lo- a little yes around the edge you see you're not it's not giving much away even when you end a level it almost feels like you're dead you're not sure whether you've died or you've actually ended the level and it's it, you know by process of it sort of using the same sequence again but with the extra bonus thing appears you think oh god i've made it to the next one mm. um now the question is is it going to keep you coming back time and time again i don't think it probably is even at budget that would be a bit of a push i think you might have an, an afternoon with it but you know are you going to come back to it i don't know music was all right boppy enough i suppose melodically forgettable is how i described it um yeah. so it was all right but for three quid, well, graphics aren't too bad. It's nippy and it's fast and there's no bugs in it, um, which is a good thing. So it's a good budget game. I think it's just a bit limited in its appeal and its gameplay. But for three quid, it's not bad, I suppose. Not bad. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I thought. It's it's okay. It just just lacks variety, which is a shame. You just do the same thing over and over again. I mean, it got yeah. 72%, and I think that's about right because technically it's good and for the price it's all right. But you just a bit more investment in this and a few more stages and a bit more looping. And like you said, a bit more feedback on how you're progressing through the chromosome 
it would have been you know yeah i think it would have been been onto a much more of a, a much better game a shame. yeah anyway there we go um i don't think it's zooming over the landscape i mean it's, it's a world away from what was that when we played yonks ago which led us to the uh the unfortunate version of the matrix uh hunter patrol oh, hunter patrol yeah we've gone a long way since then but there just seems to be a few of these you now the trailblazer sort of checkerboard zoomers have kind of got a bit of resurgence yeah i suppose um, once someone figures out how think, to do it well, i was gonna say i think that there was maybe a code leak or something but we'll well you just we'll come- press that press the uh back button on the uh in the watch it the uh, what's it called the cartridge Begins with the yeah e. yeah exactly yeah the expert cartridge expert people cartridge, been hacking yes. out and they've figured out that you can do sort of a decent raster effect we actually did a checkerboard effect like that in, a, in an s express demo See? so it, sh- it shows you it must have been bloody easy because we did it so everyone's doing it everybody's doing it that's it doing it doing it <laughs> Picking the nose and chewing it, chewing it, <laughs> chewing it. Chewing. <laughs> anyway, I'm surprised that's anyway. not. A, I'm surprised that's not an event in Western games. That's it. That's it. That's it for this part. That's your four games. That's our first four. We've got five more coming up later on. But before we get to there, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with a look at what was going on in the cinema in January 1988. Some big films out. So stay around. Stick around. Stick around. So obvious. Yeah. Such low hanging fruit, and I can't believe I missed it. <laughs> See you in a bit. <laughs> The novel Escape from the Commodore 64 by David Hearn is out now. Growing up in the 80s is a chore for Sarah, who feels misunderstood by her parents and badgered by Reese, her bothersome brother who incessantly prattles on about his treasured computer games. When Reese tells her one of the games tried to pull him inside the computer, she laughs off his fanciful fib. She waggles the joystick to disprove his fairy tale and is pulled into the computer. Now trapped in games she'd never had any interest in playing, how can she possibly beat them? With the help of Feisty Nell, another trapped player, can Sarah find her way back home or is it game over? An evil madman, a hostile planet, bloodthirsty robots, a never-ending throng of karate experts and relentless digital soldiers will do their best to ensure Sarah never escapes. Available from Amazon and all good online retailers, find out if there's a way out of the beige bread bin of betrayal for Sarah in Escape from the Commodore 64. And we are back, as promised. Let's get into cinema. There are only four films out this month, but there's there's some there's some stuff here. There's some stuff that came out. First of January, the very, very first day of the year, the very first day, we have Predator. Predator's out. Oh. Predator is Predator's released. Da 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 Great well, soundtrack that is. It is. What they got you doing, Graham? Pushing too many pencils, <laughs> pens, whatever it is. What's this tie business? <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> I watched it last night actually in preparation for this. Yes, I had to watch actually. it. I had to watch same. it. It's good actually because it's quite ha- quite handy. This has just come out because the uh, new one's out, isn't it? Prey. We can talk about that as well. well the, yes, the, the new lineage, and also um, there is a an amazing remaster Blu-ray of Predator, which is called the I forget what it's called. There's a special edition edition. Which has got some amazing stuff in it, so we're checking it, that. out It as needs well. a remastering because the I watched the 4K version on Disney and uh, last night, and the, the the original print is um it's it's not the best. Yeah, definitely the, the Blu-ray re- because there's a several. Obviously, there's always several Blu-ray remasters, isn't there? They don't, someone remasters it and go, "You haven't remastered that nearly good enough." I'll re- give it to me. I'll remaster it. <laughs> but the most recent one is the one I've I've watched, and it's quite quite clear. Quite good it is. Yeah. It's nice. I mean, it's very good. refreshing. Just very a, refreshing. You, you can't do some of some of those shots, which are, you know, that bit where he falls into the water. Oh the... dear. No. Something <laughs> went badly wrong there, didn't it? When it goes <laughs> great grain like... vision. Yeah, they're like what you forgot the camera. Yeah, all I've got is this uh, Fisher Price film. But didn't flip. the didn't the stunt man get horribly injured? Who did that in that as well? I think probably he really did. Anyway, Predator, what a film! I mean, it well actually, it's it's a, it's a bit of a classic, isn't it? It's another one of those sci-fi classics that kind of like Aliens. I think before it re- sort of to some extent, yeah. Say um, you know, it was a lot of 
staples of the genre, this kind of action sci-fi genre. Um, there's loads of films that came out like you know like this afterwards. I think and this had a big big impact. I think is this. Would you say? I mean, this was is this Annie's biggest? I think Terminator probably rules the roost there. But the first um, one or Terminator uh, Two. Well, probably Terminator Two and Terminator Terminate probably the, the Terminators. Um, to but some it, extent. let's say of his eighties action films, because I mean, Predator Terminator Two is post post nineties sort of thing. So it was, well, I think you know, term, term, it's definitely up there with this Terminator Predator Commando. I think they're the kind of the holy you know trinity of Schwarzenegger because it's better than Running Man. Running Man's a bit of an also ran and stuff like that. And there's a few others that aren't as good. Predator is certainly one of his best. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a crazy, and I, I did um, find myself when I was watching it last night that I do. I came to the conclusion that I like the first two thirds of this film way better than the final third. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately suffers from that the same problem. Funny enough, the Predator, which comes later, suffers from the exact same problem as well. It's yeah. I think it's been better in the most recent film, but that last third where he builds his builds his defense out and everything, and from the moment he falls in the water, it all just gets a bit thin. Because the opening section where you're not quite sure what's going on, you're not quite sure what's happened to the team. You find Hopper um, all skinned and everything; it's all grim, and you know you, you're going in. You have that fight, the crazy fight, shootout at the camp. It's the first, you know, end of the first section, and then off they head into the jungle, and the predators tracking them, and you just start getting the heat signatures, and the death start mounting up. That's all great, all great. It's brilliantly done. You really feel like what's going on. Predator reveal. It's a good design. Don't get me wrong. But not. It's all. Right, it's great. But the film takes a bit of a just pauses, doesn't it? Really, it does a bit. I think though, it's obviously because it's a switch, isn't it? So it goes from the predator being the predator to Arnie being the predator. That's kind of the whole point mm. of that sort of switch. And the most recent one does the exact same thing as well. Yeah. But you're right. There is a little bit of because it goes from being an ensemble to being one, two, well, two characters: the predator and, and Arnie. Yeah. And there is that sort of sequence in there where they just, you know, they basically lick their wounds and prepare themselves. You know, Predator does a little bit of cleaning, doesn't he? Cleans his skulls and, you know, brushes his, dusts up his weapons and that. Yes. And he sort of, you know, makes a lot of little wooden stakes and then, you know, shouts, <laughs> lights a fire and shouts, <laughs> shouts over a cliff and all that. He does, yeah, which which was r- remarkably uh, well copied, sort of thing, when we did our version of Predator in the uh, Grimsby, yes, <laughs> Grimsby Greenery. <laughs> yeah, when we did that little, yeah, when we did that little playlet version, one of my in, best uh, screens. Place. Yeah, yes, it, you you emulated that stood on a park bench. Um, <laughs> I did. <laughs> very strange experience. Yeah, <laughs> it's as strange as it sounds, and it's I, I'm not going to describe any more of it than that. Um, I think Predator is it's such a well executed film and it has such a great cast of the right characters. It set the ben- I think it set a benchmark. You would not have a Gears of War film if you did if Predator didn't exist. Because the mainstay of the character types in the Gears of War games mm. are definitely good point, ste- yeah. the stereotype bodybuilder turned military people from is, the Predator it, series. It is heavy on the burl. Yeah, and I like that about it though. I mean they're the most unlikely soldiers known to man. There's no way they're going for a jungle quietly. That sneak <laughs> now when it's just not happening is it you know no. bodybuilders don't are not known for their deaf nimble movements and and stealth you know, they're kind of big dudes i've, I've forgotten <laughs> laughed laughed out loud when jesse ventura finds that tripwire <laughs> it just made me laugh <laughs> <It's> like, <gasps> <laughs> but I, I love that that whole you know the whole stupidity of that that mission the fact that they fly in in a helicopter you know they're in a stealth helicopter with music blaring out just it's just stuff like <laughs> yeah, that they're, that a, they're a rescue team me. not assassins <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what. But they're not a rescue team. They don't actually rescue anyone, really, do they? They just blow an entire base up with yeah. really heavy. They're really heavily armed, overarmed. That's what I like about it. Especially that one guy. Was it uh, Blaine? Is it Blaine? Yeah, Blaine um, with his minigun. Yeah, Jesse Ventura walks around with a minigun, but he he carries it in kind of a bag. You know, he's just bagged <laughs> up a minigun. It's like he unbags his minigun. It's like, wow. Yeah, because what's like, using like, before like it would then? Matter. Well, what, what, like it would matter. Just carry it around without bagging it. We don't need to. It's just strange that it requires a, a handled bag to carry that, like it's concealed weapon. Um, and then it's just, you know, it's it's all for show, isn't it? Um, but it's there's some really there's some really great moments in it. There's some really silly moments in it. The bit where Cal Weathers loses his arm and stuff like that, because it's you start to see a little bit, the cracks in some of the edges of it start to show because it's a long time to be based in a sweaty jungle where the mainstay of character development is either them looking shiftily at each other, being angry with each other, or sweating beads of sweat while staring at things. Yeah, no, There's a I, lot I also, of that goes on. I also found as well that Carl Weathers' stomach was hypnotically, hypnotically <laughs> in and out. And I don't understand, <laughs> how, I don't know, I don't understand how you can have that six-pack and breathe out that much. There's something no. weird going on in that man's stomach. 
He's very muscular in every way. <laughs> he really is, but you can't have that much of a six pack and then be able to push your stomach out like a barrel. I mean, uh, this great anomalies in Predator. I love the fact that their super brilliant tracker guy, Billy, leads them into the, some of the most deadly traps of all. Because <laughs> he's meant to be the one that's tracking it. All he does is spend the whole film going, I can't see anything. There's something out there. I don't know what it is. We're all going to die. And then he leads them into a trap where they all get killed. And then he goes and kills himself on a bridge. You're rubbish at your job, mate. No, <laughs> yeah. Get out. Who are- <laughs> <laughs> did, did anyone want to switch places? That's what I'd be saying if I was on the helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Is this a Shane Black film? Uh, Shane written Black? by... He's in it, isn't he? Yeah, he's in it. Yeah, he's Poncho, isn't he? Uh, but, let me have a look. I'm not sure if Shane... I, I think he wrote... No, writers Jim and John Thomas. All right. So, so I thought he had something to do with it, but I guess he's in it, I suppose. I, I believe that he may have done some little sort of snippets of uh, dialogue. I mean, but- there's clever touches to this. The Predator is brilliant in this. I mean, that's the, like, the the key thing about this that is easy to forget about is you don't see the Predator for a significant proportion of the film. And they play that to their advantage really well in this film. Considering the film's called Predator, you don't actually see what the Predator is till quite late on. And I, and I find that's, that's quite intoxicating for a film of this type. It really does lead you in nicely to that. The mm. reveal of the predator, you know, which is in, later down the line, some of it's a bit iffy, but that moment where it takes its mask off, you know, for the dust up with Schwarzenegger, is the, the effects? Is it um, famous effects guy did the effects in it? Stan Winston, name? isn't it? Stan Winston, the the monster makeup and the actual mask and the animation of its little crab face, whatever you call that. Um, <laughs> I think that's brilliant. It's just yeah. the the pity of this film is that it has that awful, awful ending. I actually turn it off before it gets to that where the end credits come and you see oh, smiley, yeah, happy yeah. faces. I, it makes me angry even thinking well, about actually, it. Well, you can roll it back further sort of thing because I think it should end at the explosion. That whole, yeah, potentially, that, yeah. That, that whole trumpet solo with Schwarzenegger stood there in the middle of a, you know, a, a massive explosion. Jungle. Yeah, jungle sort yeah. of thing. Just stood there with a bit of ash on him. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I mean... Should have been it, done with. It's just that, again, it's sort of, you have to keep your, you know, your, your bank alive, don't you really, I suppose, is the... The rule of thumb, but there's some amazing sequences in Predator. It's such a clever, clever film, and obviously, as you know, you've rightly said, the the most recent variation of the you know of the franchise is out there on Disney Plus at the minute. Prey, which Prey, is actually yeah. pretty damn pretty good. Ah, uh, yeah, it's um, really good. Recommend it. Um, this there's, there's some there are still some issues with it. You know, there's some issues around superpower things and stuff like that. But I quite liked it because it's certainly the best Predator movie that's been around. Because Predator Two was on the right track, but it sort of lost its way a bit and it was a bit stupid in places. And then after that, well, it just goes downhill from there. The Aliens versus Predator yeah. movies, with the exception of the second one, or is it Aliens Predator Requiem or whatever it's called? Aliens one versus Predator, really, the really gory one. Yeah, there's one that's really stupidly violent and really over violent. You know, it's, it's actually quite horrific in almost every way. Yeah, that's the second. That's Alien versus Predator two. Yeah, not so the first one. No, there's, there's there's moments, but most of them aren't partic- aren't very good. And they try and develop this sort of narrative, which is leaning on some of the Predator Aliens versus Predator comics, which were a dark horse publication mm. i used to read them and i really liked them but they were never something that should have been made into a part of this franchise no but maybe not i suppose the question you have is because predator 2 takes it into the city which is kind of where you'd expect it to go but the trouble is where do you go with the predator story they should, perhaps should have just left it as predator because other than taking the predator to new locations you know which is kind of like the you know what's he going to be it's going to do it take a tour of australia are we going to go to the outback? Is it going to be a crocodile predator? You know, is it where is it going to end? Uh, because really, all you're doing is taking the predator problem and relocating it with a different bunch of military people, and that's what Predator Two kind of did. And they just don't seem to do that when they tried doing something different with that one that's set on a kind of alien planet where the people just get there cube style and just get there and wake up and they've all got you know a bit of a story to tell, and then oh, they find. Uh, um, uh- is that the Predator? No, that's the more, that's the that more recent one. It's Predators. Predators. The one with the guy, Texas, Texas Predator with a samurai sword. And they've yeah, got, it's, it's um, got Adrian, Adrian Brody, isn't it, isn't he? It's that one. Yeah, that Adrian Brody, yeah, playing a real, you know, the tough military Lawrence, guy. Doesn't Lawrence quite Fishburne. Work. Yeah, as, as Mad Guy. Yeah, he just plays Mad Guy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely um, Mad just, Guy. It's, it loses its way, stupidly, that, that it one. It does. But, I, I would say about Predator 2, though, that Predator 2 is kind of like almost the opposite of Predator in as the way I see it, because I'm really not a big fan of the opening to Predator 2. That no, opening shoot, shootout in the Mexican stupid. city, Mexican in LA and stuff, and the stupid you know, use of music when that guy goes flying around. However, once it kicks in and gets going, it, it really gets going. I really like like the last, like the two second, last two thirds of Predator 2 are ace. Really good. And so that that's, you know, I think it's kind of the opposite of Predator, which I think I'm not a big fan of. The, I can get it. I understand what you're saying, but I think it... I know. I think, I'm, I'm not saying it's amazing, but the problem with Predator 2 is that it, it tries to add things that aren't necessary. So it adds loads of weird city-based gangs 
It's not that's, necessary. Yeah, that's its main issue, yes. It's not necessary. So for some reason, they have to include that. So it ends up being a kind of an urban warfare because they need some kind of conflict in the city. So therefore, you must have, you know, the was it the Jamaican voodoo posse? Or, just yeah. stupid. You don't need any of that. No, a predator just killing people is enough. Yeah. Um, but either and it's way, it's very cliche, isn't it? Have some ganja man. Oh, don't it? Just that <laughs> stupid, like, oh stupid sequence and that Gary Busey character. It's just oh, I love Gary wild Busey, teeth. Is. Yeah, yeah, but they, you know the whole <laughs> idea that they can try and corner a predator in a warehouse full of beef. It's like when you were writing these words, <laughs> did you not think this is weird? <laughs> You know, at what point did you not you know it's so they, fight, they know they, it's got heat vision so, yeah but, but they, so they go in there with freeze guns it's like what just just st- take a step back from what you're writing here just remember where it was based originally and what it's about and that it's a futuristic visitor to this planet from another world with advanced space travel and weaponry but you know, they, know that, they know it comes when it's hot and this year it is very hot Oh, so, don't, don't. And so you know that they know they've got to take it somewhere cold so they lure it into the uh, beef beef fridge I mean I liked the idea that the, the original Predator had that kind of almost Rambo Commando esque type of main character that was completely out of his depth with what he was facing. I really like that because these characters never are normally like that in these. Rambo and Commando are absolutely in control of everything. They don't go into any situation where they're not going to come out on top. You know, they can handle every weapon, they can do everything. In this, he's, you know, he's watches everybody he knows get killed with the exception of two people. And so, and then he decides, right, the only way I'm going to fight this is by, you know, getting, go, going on the hunt myself. I, I, I really like that about it because it does twist that kind of, that idea on its head. It's a clever film, Predator, and the, the director was brilliant. It's really, because it's lean. I mean, it's an $18 million budget for Predator. Not mm. a lot of money for a film of that type. No, it's not. John McTiernan um, won it. Yeah, and it, and it's opening in its opening opening weekend. It made twelve million. Yeah, I mean, he's the guy. He's gonna he goes on so, to do Die Hard, doesn't he? Yeah. So, so the, know, guy the guy knows how knows. to make action. Yeah. yeah. Did he do? And he does. Did he do? No, it was Richard Donner. Was it? So yeah, Donner, Richard Donner, and John McTiernan at this point were just pumping out the best action films of the eighties. Yeah. So I think Predator is really really cool, but not the only cool film this month. No, I mean, uh, yeah, I love it. It is very it is very good, and, and I've I'm down on it, but I still I like the ending. It's just not as good as the first two thirds. And I no, think no, 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 absolutely right. That's that's my main issue with it. It kind of sort of stalls a little bit for me. Um, it's really good. I mean, there's so much, so many quotable lines from it as well. As I said, you know, stick oh, around, eminent, get, to, get to the quotable. chopper. Um, yeah. But there's loads of weird bits in it as well, like you said, around the edges. Like watching it last night on a pristine, you know, Disney 4K, whatever it was, when Mac gets his head blown off, mm. <laughs> which is the stupidest thing. In the, he's supposed to be like, you know, this is the guy, remember, who eats green berets for breakfast or whatever it is, or, or commandos or whatever in, from Commando. So he's crawling along the floor. And he's like, oh, what's these three red lights on my arm? Like, you're in a jungle. Yeah. What are they going to be? Yeah, what, what, yeah. What are they going to be? <laughs> Don't I mean, he must be experienced in the idea that snipers use those kind of infrared targeting systems because he he's a so. you know, military superman, but there you go. So he looks up and gets his head blown just to smithereens. There's yeah. a blast into the camera. And then when um, uh, Carl Weathers, when Dylan sees him across the way, his head's all normal and not, not a mark yeah, on it. It's it, it, just foot twitchy, you know, foot twitching bad, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's great. I mean, what, because he's, and also as well, why does Schwarzenegger survive when he gets hit with a laser when Jesse Ventura's chest gets blown out? Yeah, it just depends on, you know, I, I think the, the general consensus around that is that he wasn't trying to kill Schwarzenegger. He saw him as the leader and wanted to take him on in a fist fight later. Is that, okay, all right, I'll yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> Anyway, it's really good. It's Predator. It's a classic, and I sound like I'm down on it. I'm not. I do love it. It's brilliant. But and so watch that. I mean, I really thoroughly enjoyed. How old watching does it that make you then? If it's 1988, my God, is that like 30 odd years old? That's 34 years old. Oh my lord! Holy lordy lord! Okay, okay. Yeah, actually, that reminds me. You just reminded me. We was going to do a little bit about um, whether we can make Billy laugh, but we've, I think we've talked about the film, and we don't want this bit to go on forever, so we won't do that. But no, I don't. I think Billy's been laughing through the through the episode. Yeah, he, well, he'll he, join he, in when he wants. He's Billy. Yeah, he does what he likes. Absolutely. You know, he'll he'll laugh when he likes. He laughs. He only laughs at uh, Hawkins' second joke. He does. Yeah. He, don't, he don't, Well, he, he does. He laugh at the. He doesn't laugh at the first one. Doesn't, does he? Just, just gives him a look while putting on face paint. Yeah. 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 And then he actually does chuckle, and you can hear it in the background when. Mac kills that pig, pig, and he says, "You couldn't have killed anything oh, yeah. bigger." And you, you hear him go hoo, 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 hoo. in the background. Yeah, he does, yeah, he does do. a Billy laugh. Yeah. Good old Billy laugh, a Billy laugh. Yeah. All right, there we go. That's um, that's Predator that came out the first of January. If you wanted more cheering up, a week later, 
8th of January, you could have gone see Near Dark. It's a dark is, old grim film, isn't it, that? It's a great film. It's, um, again, I watched this again recently. This is uh, Catherine I'm... Bigelow directed this. We mentioned it re- roughly when we were talking about that pop video, which Catherine Bigelow directed. It had um, uh, Bill Paxton in it. Can't remember, the, yes, can't remember what what song it was, but we mentioned it then. New so there's a New Order song. Oh, it was the New Order one. Yes, it was that New Order song. So uh, this is near dark. This is uh, sort of redneck vampires. I guess is the best way yeah. to to describe this. This is um, so in uh, so yeah. So the, this there's this guy called Caleb, and he gets meets this girl one night in the you know in the local sort of small town in America, uh, sort of Texas area, wherever somewhere like that. And he they, they go out, and she she bites him. Um, unbeknownst, he's just you know, been bitten by a vampire, obviously he doesn't believe that, but that's what it is. And then they come along and they take him away. And it's, it's basically this posse of vampires led by Lance Henriksen. And also, who's the, who's the woman in it? I can't remember. This. The team is J- Jenny Wright, uh, Bill Paxton, uh, Jeanette Goldstein. That's it. Jeanette Goldstein was... Uh, that's right. Uh, Vasquez, isn't it? Pretty sure. Yes. Yes, she is. Yes, and yes, she's so in Terminator she- 2 as well. Yes, yeah, so you got Vasquez, you've got Bishop, so it's a it's a real team up. Uh, you got you know Hudson, um, so you know aliens aliens on patrol. But they hear the vampires, and it's really dark, and it's a it's a it's a neo noir film in and of itself. It's a, it's got it's you know it's very long, you know loves the landscape, the use of sort of because obviously you know a lot of this film is really high contrast. So you've got this high contrast between the dark of the the you know the nighttime and the, the you know the bright sun and the bright landscapes of um, you know, southern northern america so texas and all that lot um and the the, the relationship between uh caleb and may that the girl um as, as he tries to and, and he's being hunted you know his father tries to come out for him so there's elements has reminded me a bit of uh, jeepers creepers 2 sort of maybe borrowed a little bit of the sort of plot from this the sort of similar sort of thing from that but yeah. this you know took what the 80s were doing with vampire films and just did something really different with it i mean if you think of what the 80s were doing you had things like what was that the hunger um yeah which, yeah with, with, yeah. with, with bowie with, yeah, with Bowie, I think even something like the, the remake of Cat People, I guess. Um, oh, God, uh, I know, but it's, it's you know, I know it's not it's more like and kind of genre good. subversion going. Yeah, on, exactly. You know? So the the 80s were taking these kind of these kind of films and then twisting them and making something different and approaching these. So yeah, like you said, jo- this genre staples and saying, well, what would it be like if this was happening now? And so essentially, what we have is a is a team of traveling vampires trying to deal with living out in the the backwoods of of uh, sort of America where there's not much law and order being held around and can just go about their business. You know, the, the sequence in the bar where they kill everyone, they just tra- tra- you know trounce that bar and they just go in and they're walking and he slits that guy's throat with his spurs and stuff. It's just, there's just so many great sequences in this. I really like Near Dark. I had the poster, I used to have the poster for it up on my wall when I was, I think he's got the great poster, of him, you know, all the sunlight coming through the, the holes in the wall. I really like Near Dark. What, what, what about you? I seem to have waxed lyrical about it for a while there, but it's, it's all right. Near Dark um, wasn't one of my favourites. It's a nice genre subversion. Um, there's some good sequences in it, but it does get boring. You know, there's no way around that. It's a bit dull. But um, it is one of the more grisly, you know, proper grisly um, sort of zombie movies because they were all very romanticised to this point, weren't they? They were a bit romantic and a bit, you know, vampires are all yeah. living in lofty castles. We'd and, had, you know, Dracu- we'd had that sort and- of a Dracula film, the Frank Lagella Dracula film in the late 70s and... Yeah, they're just, you know, and vampires needed a reboot and Last Lost Boys and stuff like that. And they needed a reboot. I suppose we've had Salem's Lot as well. It sort of dropped in there as well. Yeah, it just, it it, it needed to be brought down to earth a little bit. And this does it with a giant crash. Films, you know, heavily lean on this. That recent Doctor Strange movie, which, uh, which is not Doctor Strange. Is it Doctor Strange? Doctor, the one that's the sequel to The Shining. I can't remember what you call it now. Oh, Doctor Sleep. Doctor Sleep, sorry. Yeah, the Doctor Sleep movie. Um, that came out that kind of you know that explores that family of vampire type got creature type things of ghosts mm. whatever they are and they're kind of living in the squalor and you know having to suffer the you know it, the and it's kind of a bit of a mixture of that with a little bit of the lost boys sort of thrown in you could sort of see where it was heading that kind of thing and it's good well very tightly directed though that's what i'll, I'll say it's very you know it's very taut direction mm-hmm. um and i think that's that's to its credit but it's uh, and it's certainly of its time i mean it's very very you know of its, oh, absolutely of its, Tangerine it's, Dream. It's, yeah, yeah, but it's a good film, Near Dark. There's no denying it. It's not on my top, you know, great list, but I, it's certainly what, certainly worth revisiting. I watched it like you fairly recently. Forgot how brutal and nihilistic it was. 
Mm. But still, uh, and the bar scene, yeah, yeah, obviously, as you say, very, very good and really gruesome. So yeah. good stuff, yeah. If you like your vampire movies and you like that kind of subversion of the vampires and you know, in the same way that um, 50 Days of Night, is it? Or whatever, it's 40 Days of Night, whatever it's called. That's another night. one. I knew it was down to some n- numeric <laughs> it's a value. of Days of Night. <laughs> yeah, but either way, the, the, the Days of Night with, with the numbers, yeah, that uh, that's yeah. kind of thing, you know, where the vampires aren't quite what you expect. It's, it's quite good. Mm. So, yeah, all right, it's good stuff. Yeah, I also like to, I mean, just to sort of note as well, just on the final note there, it's written by Cass Bigelow, but also written by Eric Red. Um, Eric Red wrote, wrote the Hitcher. You can tell. Yeah, that's what I mean. So when you can you compare this, it's got that same stylistic nihilistic feel to it. The open road, the back, the open because it's one of those. I always find, just from a personal point of view, you've been to America. I've never been to America, but I find the distances in America always break my head somewhat. When I ever watch stuff in America, you know, TV shows, stuff like that, and they're like, oh, how, like someone was, what was I, I can't remember what I was watching, but I think they were in like the Northwest, and they were like, oh, how, how long does it take to drive down to Florida? And they're like, oh, it's about a two day drive. Yeah. And I'm yeah, like, it's a long I can get anywhere in england in about four or five hours well yeah I, was, I drove from las vegas to los angeles and the drive from las vegas to los angeles in fact the drive to, from las vegas to san francisco is probably about seven and a half hours in total yeah you, but like, you're still in california yeah that's what i mean <laughs> so, well, so it, technically you're technically you're not because you leave nevada and go to california but it's still yeah. on that but so, traveling all the way up from the north of california down to the south of california it takes you you know better part no, of a day you, probably yeah. oh yeah yeah it's a long old long old drive and, and that's so just that, one state that kind of space and distance is really alien to me and so that's what i find and, and i think that these films by eric red you know near dark the hitcher they kind of explore that open landscape where anything you know forget films like texas chainsaw massacre and things like that it's these in england we don't really have these places which are off the beaten track so far that nobody around for miles and miles and miles everything's very you're, you're yeah, only like you know there's a village every 10 miles yeah exactly and you know there's you're always dropping into something so that's why I think these films kind of appeal to me because it's a it's a it's a landscape that I just can't wrap my head around and yeah. sort of exp- exploring that ability that you can just go for you know hours and hours with barely seeing you've seen a couple of cars um, and no one about and all these things just these things might just be happening out in those spaces. I find that really kind of uh, an interest yeah. you know interesting because it's just uh, it's like almost another planet to me. It's why it's why some of the films set in Australia, the out- outback of Australia, some of the you know, the um, yeah things the, like some Wolf of those Creek work in the same. Wolf Creek, Wolf Creek's horrible. And it that's is, one yeah, of those or, or even set in that way. Same guy who did Rogue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Rogue. Um, so that, as well. that, that that's another one. Yeah, he did that guy's done more to uh, harm the Australian travel industry than anybody in the he world. Has. I think. If you don't get eaten by crocodiles, you get killed by sociopaths. That's like about. Anyway, yeah, Near Dark. I like Near Dark. It's good. After that, tenth uh, of January, there's something called Closing Ranks. Never heard of it. Couldn't find anything out about it. Even no. IMDb didn't have a lot about that. No, it didn't. Directed by Roger Grief. Uh, no idea. No no plot synopsis or anything. I don't know. It's about the police force. Um, whatever. Finally, uh, rounding out the month on the 15th of January, so there's a bit of a gap here, um, is the Kevin Costner movie No Way Out. Mm. Did you Have you watched this? No, I don't really like Kevin Costner in anything. So This is a bad film. I watched well, it last it night. It didn't look very good. I watched the trailer and that was enough for me. Well, it's got... Kevin Costner, Gene Hackman, Sean Young. The plot of this is that um, Kevin Costner falls in love with the Sean Young's character, um, who is she's kind of openly having she's openly the mistress of Gene Hackman, who's a senator. He they get Kevin Costner in to for to sort of investigate some kind of weird stuff to do with the FBI and and some kind of something about this phantom submarine. So they get him in to investigate that. In between all this, though, Gene Hackman inadvertently kills Sean Young, and then they try and pin it on this mythical uh, Russian character called Yuri, and they get Kevin Costner to, and they basically say that she he was there at the t- the time of the murder, and so they get Kevin Costner to investigate it. Now, obviously, Kevin Costner is her boyfriend, and that's who they're trying to pin it on, but no one knows that Kevin Costner is a boyfriend, so Kevin Costner is essentially investigating himself. And it sounds okay, but it's... The, the depiction, Sean Young's character is so bad. She spends, she turns up, she gets in a car with a Cadillac with um, Kevin Costner. She just, t- they just have sex. There's no real meaning towards it. She just, she turns up at a mate's house, kicks a mate's house, takes a coat off. She's completely naked. Just walks in. She spends, the the entire, she spends the entire film either getting dressed or undressed. She's just there to be a, a sexual plaything for Costner and Hackman. And then she gets killed and that's it. So she's there as a plot device and nothing else. It's really bad. On top of that, the film has the, the worst plot twist at the end that I've come across in a long while that I could spoil, but just say, I sat there and I went, you what? Last night, I went, you've just, this film is 
stupid. It was directed by Roger Donaldson, who had done some other bits and bobs that I did recognise. He did Cocktail, he directed Cocktail. He also, weirdly enough, uh, he also directed The Bounty. So, so there is okay. that. He did Cadillac Man, uh, The Getaway, Dante's Peak. He directed as well, and also Species. Yeah, good God, it's a bad film. Um, so you know the, the guys are you know decent director, but this film it's got a really good opening shot where it goes all the way across um, Washington to this house. It's got a really good opening shot and closing shot, but the rest of it when you just sit there and you went, this is unpleasant, unpleasant to watch, and I did not enjoy my time with it. And I cannot recommend that anyone go back and watch this again because it hasn't any, aged well. But in answer to your question, yes, Kevin Costner had a lot of uh, clout at one point, didn't he? It was on the back of Field of Dreams, I think, and Bull Durham. Yeah, he had quite a lot of currency when he was um, in uh, Waterworld and Robin Hood and, and JFK. JFK, and he seemed yeah. to turn up everywhere at one point. He did, and then then just disappeared. I think I think bodyguard. Waterworld was Waterworld, and yeah, he did the bodyguard, yeah. But um, and then I, I think it was Waterworld that really did it. Oh no, it was the Postman, wasn't it? Yeah, that wasn't so good, was it? Waterworld that wasn't so good. Great. Dances with Wolves as well, which he wrote, directed. That is pretty good, actually. And, yeah, so you know he was he was king of the king of the coop at one point, but then he made the postman, and no one wanted to now know after Kevin that. Kevin Low Costner, <laughs> Kevin No Costner, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Aldi. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's it. As you said, there were some good films there. Twelve two. There is, yeah. And one would never hear yeah. of one that I can't recommend at any cost. So that's it. We've got five more games still to come. Um, in this episode so we're going to go take another break once again please stick around and we'll be back in a brief moment good lord adrian what is that you're holding this graham is juices for your junk that's what this is in this hot weather it's basically saved me over the last couple of days from chafage from all kinds of horrible things. This is Crop Preserver from Manscaped. Literally full deodorant. Wow, okay. That's uh, <laughs> not something I would have thought of, but tell me more. I'm intrigued. Well, quick squirt of this and a quick rub on the old lads downstairs. And I found that in this, what, Outback style heat that we've just suffered over the last couple of days, I was less, should we say, sweaty. There was less rubbing. There was less chafage. It was all very nice. I could spread with impunity. My partner didn't particularly like me spreading with impunity across the sofa, <laughs> but hey-ho, them's the breaks. You live and learn. Um, so a bit of manscaping, a bit of rubbing of the old crop preserver led me to a much more pleasant experience. Not that these last couple of days with this heat has been pleasant, but it's certainly been more pleasant than what it would have been down below. Do you have to do your own? Or can you... Would you, I mean, would you do mine? I'll do yours. I'll do yours. If, if it's, you know, we're, we're all friends. We are all friends. I'm not. I'm not. Re- I'm, not I'm not ready for that. <laughs> but I think there's only so far friendship goes. I'll shake your hand and I'll have and I'll have some crop preserver on it. You can take that and use it on yourself. That's for final offer. And if you like offers, then if you go to Manscaped. Dot com and you use the code ZAPT20 at manscaped.com, you will get 20% off with free shipping. So yes, get 20% off and free shipping with the code ZAPT20 at manscaped.com. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. We're back with our last batch of games for January 1988. Then we're obviously on to February. So this is it, really. Uh, should we get into them? I think we should get into them. Let's just waste no time. Let's Graham, do this. We've got a, well, what can we say about this? This is uh, the 64, C64 version of Star Wars. I have no song for this. I could have done Star Trek in, but I couldn't think of a <laughs> well, song. you just got Star, Star Wars, <laughs> Return of the Jedi, <laughs> the, Empire the Empire Strikes Back. back. <laughs> um, so obviously this is copyright Lucasfilm Atari Games 10 gen apparently according to the blurb this conversion was by Vector Graphics coded by um, Darth Maul um, no, it wasn't really <laughs> coded by Daniel James real, Gallagher real window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Master Windu Ian Martin and uh, Joe Wookie Booth um, he was involved that's actually his real name as well in an ironic twist not really graphics are by John Cassells title screen John Cassells and uh, the music was by guess who yeah he's clearly for hire Dave Whitaker did the uh, the old music for this sort of <laughs> yeah. suits his kind of memo really so it's Star Wars it's exciting Star Wars the arcade the old arcade conversion wow big and kind of thing maybe a bit like the party but anyway it doesn't matter the Atari arcade is a bit of a classic and it's considered a very important arcade um it's the first 
first person rail shooter or one of the first first person rail shooter games originally designed by somebody yeah, called Mike is, Haley yeah. Yeah. and released in the arcades in 1983 goodness yep. me by Atari Inc it uses 3D color vector graphics to simulate the assault on the death star from the 1977 film of the same name of course it does developed during the golden age of arcade games this is the blurb off i think wikipedia so it's apparently been included in the greatest video games of all time i can sort of see why i'll come to a little bit about that just for those techie people that like techie things the cpus inside the arcade there were two 6809 1.5 megahertz processors one for the visuals or one for the sound i guess or maybe both well actually no one for the visuals and two for the visual i don't know but there's actually four pokey sound chips in it four four um four running at 1.5 megahertz each yes they're pokey sound chips i think they're the same ones that are in the atari atari computers in the atari yeah, yeah, so it's so, essentially yeah. a, like a hydro-powered atari console really or atari computer anyway um this is ironically not the first version that there has been on the c64 there is a, another version mm. a parker brothers version was released in 1984 only on cartridge, though, and only for Atari and the C64 on cartridge. It wasn't Vector either. It used C64 characters and sprites to its advantage. It's almost as if they knew, Adrian, that Vectors would be a real load of shit on the C64. <laughs> You don't say, Graham. The force was strong with them. It, I played it. I downloaded and played it. And I didn't think it was actually that bad. It's like a bare bones version of Star Wars, really, the arcade. But it does play like it. And with kind of mini TIE Fighters and mini sprites. Everything's a bit mini. It is a bit um, mini, that one, yeah. But a few of the details aside, it's there. And it actually plays pretty fast. And it's kind of the, the thematics are all there anyway. Onto the Vector Graphics Domark version. And it's Vector Graphics. And, well, there's a price for using Vector Graphics, isn't there? Uh, mm -hmm. It does feature a single, albeit reasonably clear, reasonably clear sample of Obi-Wan Kenobi when it loads. The Vars will be with you. <laughs> very abrupt. <laughs> yeah, it's very abrupt. Um, it's, like, it's like someone slapped him <laughs> across the face as he said it. Stop saying that, for God's sake. Like, like, just as he's just as Darth Vader's swiping him, I think. He said yeah, that. We get it. The Vars the will be... Oh! Anyway, that, that's the only arcade style sound you're going to get in this, and it's not even in the game. Um, but it does set the scene, and you've got quite a nice title screen to, that goes with that. Although I didn't know what had happened to Leia's face in that uh, title <laughs> screen. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's Star Wars, so it looks. As long as it's got the word Star Wars on it, you're going to get. You're going to kind of get it. Yeah. And it's from the outside in, this does kind of look like the arcade from the outside in. It doesn't play like it though, not really. Obviously, the game is based around sequences in the Star Wars film. So you, obviously, you're Luke Skywalker in the seat of his famous you know red five is a famous x-wing and in this you've got to engage in space battles with tie fighters zooming across the death star surface in not the first level because it doesn't do it in the first one but it does in subsequent levels mm -hmm. shooting turrets and towers and then the infamous trench run where you've got to blow up the death star and um, you basically in the game got to try and survive long enough to get through the next part you don't have to shoot a certain amount of things you just got to survive long enough in those sequences to get to the next section that's the same as the arcade logic yeah and in each part you control the mini crosshairs and shoot at the enemies and they're fireball like bullets vector based sort of imagery is such as it is and as you complete each wave you progress eventually blowing up the death star of moving on to more of the same with more difficulty and more things and that's it's arcade it's an arcade logic so it's 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 kind of like star wars the arcade this it's kind of like it if you removed all the speed the animation and some of the frames of animation and the excitement and the pace you're probably not far off what you get the arcade of star wars is quite an important landmark it's obviously it's on on rails fps as we've said and many of those do follow there's a few speech samples now, I don't know if they're actual samples from the film or synthesized speech, because I, I, I didn't have main to try and replay, and I couldn't remember. What, the I arcade, what, the arcade yes, version? Yes, yeah, I think the arcade's got... I think it, says, it, says, well, it says synthesized speech and the main technical readout for it, but I don't know if that means it's sample. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's got Star Warsy sounds. More Star Warsy sounds than the C64 one has, principally mm. the, the, the thing. Um, and the, in the cabinet, of course, it's really loud. It's in mono only, by the way, but it's glorious mono, loud mono in the arcade, isn't it? It's and it's a sit-in cabinet shaped like a cockpit of a bloody X-Wing. Yes, exactly. Which is kind of the really important thing. So it's, and it had a really fancy sort of controller as well. Looked like the one that, almost like the TIE Fighter controller, but also the X-Wing. So it's a, it's a really, really getting you feel like you're inside, you're stepping inside something mm -hmm. else, something different. In 1983, I can't tell you how that felt because everyone was buzzing. I mean, Star Wars is a phenomenon. It's easy to write off unfortunately now to look at the star wars franchise as it's become and even with some of the tv shows to look at the franchise as it is now that i cannot tell you as a as a child of the late 80s late 70s early 80s how exciting being around star wars was as a franchise as a as a kid mm -hmm. it's just a phenomenal thing to have experienced now i don't think anyone nowadays can even get to grips with how it felt to be that excited about seeing an arcade of Star Wars and getting inside what it felt like was the 
magical experience and the, even the vector experience which it was it really felt like you was in star wars it's really important that yep. because you get that real sense in that cabinet and all of that's very important well you take all that away and we said this about every arcade pretty much that has this kind of thing you take away the that specialness and you're left with the core game the core game isn't really that much for star wars flying around shooting stuff over a time thing it's an on rails thing it's it's there's not a lot to do so but it, the important part of the arcade was the experience of sitting in a the cockpit of an X-wing fighter and, and feeling that you was inside that amazing battle. Everyone my, our age had seen the famous trench run in Star Wars and experienced that. Use the Force, Luke, and all of that. All those sounds and all those things feed right into your imagination. So when you're in that playing it as a kid, or when you go into that arcade, it is exactly like you are in the movie. Take all that away, and you've got the C64 version and the graphics. The kind of a medium res, vari- an odd medium res variation of vectors, which don't really work. They're, they're slow and jerky and they're not very good. It, all the excitement and the speed of the arcade is lost. The excitement and, and you control it with a joystick. It's not the same. It's not the same. Obviously, there's limitations on a C64 and everything else, but you're taking away the really important parts. And so you really are left with the core game. Now, it needs then more Star Wars-y stuff to make it feel a bit more. And that's not just the tokenistic version of the, the bounty version of the music that you get at the beginning of it. It needs more than that. Without that, it just feels like a, another sort of 3D shooter that's not very good. It's a bit slow. The flying around isn't much fun. When you get to the trench, your mine was empty. There was nothing in the trench. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's <laughs> stuff in it. Now, every now and again, I was menaced by, by an easily shot sort of bullet from something. But there was nothing in there. It was just empty. Mm-hmm. No, where was the I have you now? Where was the you know uh, um, you know and all of the excitement of that sequence where you know it even it needs that music and that nah, 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 nah. it needs all of that. You need that for it to work. Without all of that, this is a it's like playing something with its spirit removed. Now, I, technically, I don't know that how much chops I would give this because I don't think it's a very good vector game anyway, and I don't like vectors on the C sixty four. There's not enough Star Wars stuff here to make it feel like it's really giving the arcade justice. And considering this is an arcade from 1983, I feel that they could have done a bit more. And it's not just like it's a you know a little franchise. This is massive. So I don't know. I think it's I don't know how much technical ability they had. But if I look at that Parker Brothers version, it played a bit better. Why didn't they just take some lessons from that? I don't know. I don't know. So I love Star Wars. We'll always like Star Wars, and I have fond memories of my first encounters of this arcade and it's still you know those feelings are still the same i went to the arcade club recently sat in the same cabinet and you still feel that excitement it's still there mm-hmm. not with this though this was just like it was like a you know it, it was just wasn't star wars enough for me it's just not quite there and at that kind of vectory slow pace just ruined the experience no I, I wouldn't want it. i would never choose to play this on a c64 not if i really really like star wars that much so it's an approximation of an experience i suppose not going to blow your socks socks off it's jerky and stilted and unpleasant really and and it's just a bit repetitive so <laughs> like not worth 10 quid <laughs> <laughs> no it's not um it's always science fiction when you're out and about um, true. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's ten pounds worth of. I don't know. People might buy it because it's Star Wars. I don't know. What, what do you think of it? Yeah, ten pound for this seems a bit steep. You know, we're talking far. Oh, it is. This, yeah, this is four five four five year old arcade here. Yeah? Uh, it has everything. Bar the speech. You said the proper music from the arcade. So bar the speech and the proper music from the arcade. But the arcade's four to five years old at this point. And yeah, it was cutting edge back then. And don't get me wrong, it was. It, it's you know. But, you know, this is all rendered in the C64's favourite graphics mode, you know, vectors. And, well, yeah. this version doesn't manage to keep up with the action in a reliable way, and that's the main problem here. It's easy to see and hear the frame rate drop. You can actually see it dropping and hear it as things go slower. As you're holding down the fire button to keep shooting, your fire rate drops. Mm, mm. And as you're, you know, so it's like, uh, and you're jerkily moving this crosshair around the screen as TIE fighters lurch back and forth it's my frame rate is massive the alert jug, jug, jug. It's like, oh my god um you know just it's harder to play than it should be it's not smooth it's not it, it, you know you're whipping it around in the arcade version shooting stuff as you know the vectors it's all good you know and like you said that parker brothers version it's simplistic but things moved at a decent pace at least and so i don't know yeah it's a strange release this at this point well you know 1988 87 that's end of 87 beginning of 88 I can't understand why this, they thought this would be a good I- idea to put out now. I mean, was the was there any kind of Star Wars cachet to be had at this point? You oh, know, was was it, was it would it, have been out on? It must have been out on video by then. So, and Empire Strikes Back and Jedi were both out by then. Yeah, it would have been well out on video and stuff by this point. So I can't understand that. You know, maybe it's just like it's nobody properly licensed a Star Wars game. We should get on that and do a version. Like, just have a why, bit of that. Why it? was there any? I mean, was there any real desire? Because don't forget, right? And I 
don't disagree with you. When the videos came out, everyone was watching them when they showed on TV and things like that. There was, they're a big deal. But there was a point towards the end of the 80s where the, the, the Star Wars, because we didn't have the internet and there wasn't that constant fan, whatever you want to call it, this constant sort of cycle of fan, everything's brilliant, we've got to keep talking about it and keep talking about it. You kind of lost interest a bit. You, you, Star Wars wasn't a big thing oh, by this older. point. <laughs> yeah, we we got older, but also as well, you know, there was there was new stuff out, and all you had was print. So print magazines and newspapers were covering the new stuff. You didn't have this constantly going back to look at the old stuff anymore. It was constant movement, movement forward. There was a lot of stuff coming out in the eighties, lots of stuff moving. So was anyone really was there any desire for this? I don't know. It seems a sod thing. I mean, this was at this point as well. It's more of a curio in the arcades by this point, left in the dust by things like Space Area, which you know yeah, blow it out of yeah, the water yeah, from a yeah, tech point old. of view. We're, we're, why? I don't understand. If anyone knows why Domark thought this was a good idea to bring out at this point, I'd, I'd, let us know because I don't get it. I really don't. It's not terrible. It, it, it's probably the best the C64 could do if when done in a vector style. But it's a vastly inferior version of a five-year-old arcade game. It's just plain odd. And the music's rubbish too, I thought. We should have had an awesome Chariots of Fire style rendition of the Star Wars theme. You know, Galway showed that what could be done with a you know classic bit of music. There's no reason why we can't have a big bombastic Star Wars, chunky Star Wars theme done by someone decent. You know, what have we got? Not that. Rubbish. No, I didn't get this. I didn't understand it. It's a weird release, and I don't understand it. It's treading on a license. There's, who cares at this point? Did we? I mean, I didn't go buy it. I'd buy games that I wanted back then, and I didn't even... No. Remember, I, don't, I don't even remember playing this version. I remember playing it, because I remember loading it, and it, it took ages to load, and then it went, the force will be with you. And then it actually loaded the game in after that. It's like, oh, that loading for that. Bloody hell. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. thinking that. It's just pointless. I don't get it. Didn't get it. Yeah, there you go. Star Wars. Strange release at a strange time. Don't get me wrong. I love the Star Wars arcade game, and still do, but this release is a weird one. We've seen this with other ones. It's like them ocean... Uh, versions of uh, the Mario games and stuff. Donkey Kong and things. Ports out of time. Ports out of time. Out of time, absolutely. Out of time. There we go, Star Wars. Let's move along. Better than what's coming next, though. Put it that way. Because next is you only sky twice. <laughs> I can't think of a student. Sounds like you, well, you only live once, Don't twice, whatever it is. Accredit this nonsense <laughs> any more than it bloody deserves. <laughs> no, I'm not. This is sky twice. This is nine pound ninety five. I could not believe that price when I read it. Uh, it's got seven percent. This has got to be short, baby. I don't know. Okay, sky twice. It's the product of American action and voodoo games. It has coding by Mons Nasman and music by Bo Melberg. It's the only thing they ever made that I could see. And I guess you have to look to the upsides in every dark cloud. Not to be mean, but because <laughs> this cloud is very Thank dark. Thank God. Very, very dark. So anyway, the third planet of Zeta Centauri has been invaded, and only you can sort this crap out by walking to the right, shooting every badly drawn sprite that comes at you and falling into the bottomless pits of water that prevent your progress. That's it. There you go. That's this game. Awful. It's an auto-scrolling blaster which sees your robot man thing. What is that? What are you? I don't want to think about it. Wander to the right. Shoot stuff and try and jump over the obstacles in your way. There are eight levels, but forget seeing many of them as you will probably turn this off in anger and disgust after about five minutes of play. The graphics are from the My First Graphics level of sprite design. Your main character is, I think, an armoured soldier, but the way he constructs himself at the start of each of your life makes me think that's not right. Maybe he's a robot or something. I don't know. What's going on? He kind of builds himself upwards. Very strange. The two enemies I saw were a bird that flies across the top part of the screen at just the wrong time for you to jump and avoid it. And the other is a sort of fat squat dragon thing that sort of appears. You can shoot them both, that's right. but shoot, shooting the bird is a pain in the ass. As to get level with it, you must jump and fire at the right time, and that's a bad thing. Jumping in this is a pain in the ass. The backgrounds are just solid colours and some lines to represent what I think might be igloos and a sunset sky. I don't know. The UI at the top has your score, the high score, the stage you're on, and your enemy, uh, which you lose a chunk of every time you fall in a pond or hit an enemy. You'll do this frequently, and once it runs out, it's game over. Um, hitting anything sends you back to the beginning of the level, and beginning of the level, you're on. And now, th- th- the real nightmare of this is the level design and the way it controls. Okay, so you, are, you have two jumps, which is just pressing straight up and, and one forward, a diagonal jump. But only the forward one really can clear the big pools on the floor, but it clears them massively. And if you jump when you're near them, you'll just land in the next one straight after it, leading to instant death, instant death. So the only way to avoid this is to backpedal, because remember, it's an auto-scroller. So it's auto, it's going to the right all the time. So you have to backpedal, so hold to the left as soon as you land. And then he does this kind of 
weird slow moonwalk backwards to try and sort of cope with the the, the scrolling which is going on oh, and nothing dear. seems right and that kind of gives you some space to land in and and then you can do the same try and jump over the next one but you can't shoot and backpedal this is what i was asking everyone on the thing you can't so if you shoot it stops you backpedaling so you have to shoot the dragon but then it stops you backpedaling then you'll probably go forward too fast to land in the next thing it's awful and so the, all that time there's the bird getting in the way at the top that just arrives at the wrong time so you're gonna fall in a pond and just do, and if you just do an up jump because it didn't recognize the diagonal, which happens all all the time, you'll just go up and just land in the middle of the pond, and it's all rage inducing. There's no way I can describe how raging well, such rage inducing this game is. It's terrible. But this all by the way is five seconds into the first level. We're not not talking level two, level three. You know, some way design. This is five seconds. This is literally the very beginning. There's no design here. Just a series of pixel perfect jumps from the off. It's absolutely infuriating. I mean, it's dreadful. Um, on the UI at the top. Part of it is taken up with the text that just says "The Doom of Sky Twice." What does that even mean? That's what you feel when you play it. What? What is it? I don't get it. It's not like the game has anything going for it. So, "The Doom of Sky Twice," like, okay, it makes it just makes you want to persevere. The music's bland. The visuals are crap. The controls are clunky. The backgrounds are bland and uninteresting. Crap, crap. Everything's crap. Everything about this game is bad from the ground up. The only good thing is the way the word "voodoo" moves around on the title screen. I quite like that bit demoish sort of the way it sort of the sort the sprites, of sprites. The sprites yeah, go in a sequence. Yeah. yeah absolutely that was quite nice it's the only game seemingly by these people and i wonder what happened to them i don't know they never made another game maybe they just went up to work on demos i don't know if you if you're about if you let us know i'm sorry i'm so bad but this is games awful it's a terrible game that once again should never have been released it reminded me of that really terrible fighting game we looked at that could be ran through with one move um oh, what was God, that i can't, I can't remember what that was called was called but in the, in that it's never been played by anyone but the developer and the company that released it and had no inkling of QA. And you factor in, I, when, I, when I first played this, I thought, oh, it's a budget, I'll budget title, I'll give it. And then I noticed, actually, it's 20, it's 10, it's 10 quid. It's 10 quid. If you spent 10 quid on this, you would you would be unhappy, very unhappy. You would be, you'd be take, this would be, you know, a magnet would be ta- taken to this on tape. Awful. The title makes no sense as well. What the hell is Sky Twice? What's it mean? I don't know. It's the no doom idea. of Sky Twice. Anything. You're on Zeta Kentori of the third planet of it. It's the planet Sky Twice. I don't know. I don't understand it. It's a true clagnut of a release. Awful. Awful in every way. This is one of the worst things I've seen. This is Alice in um, Video Land bad. In the fact that it's just awful, 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 awfulness, awfulness. I'm saying no more about it. What did you think? I couldn't believe this was really a, a published and produced C64 game, if I was honest. It looked like it was probably somebody's very first game and definitely their last. <laughs> yeah, and they were, prob- the, the was. computer was taken away from them and told, they were told I never mean, to do this bad thing again. I mean, what the hell? Badly drawn, horribly animated, badly designed, downright stupid. They're just kind things to say. Not a, this is not a publishable game, in my opinion. It should never have no. left the, hey, look what I did, conversation stage. Um, we were probably having with the toddler that made it. The background is a confusing array of igloos, shark fins, hills, and rainbows. <laughs> so, um, the character looks like something a four-year-old would construct from fuzzy felt. And it was animated like something that would be submitted to Screen Test, that TV show, that kids' TV show back in the uh, <laughs> yeah, late 70s, early 80s. I describe the animation as like one of the really early character 2D character tutorials from Unity from about 25 years ago, done yeah. by an imbecile <laughs> and submitted for a BA that we were both taught on. <laughs> Um, say no more about that it's terrible it's terrible this is no more of a game adrian than i am a banana um i wouldn't want to play this guy once it was trash get rid of it get, get it off the screen leave it alone walk away walk away just leave the gasoline and walk away with that one it's awful it did it to did you as well look like he had a, a, a gray kilt on as well yeah it just it, it, i don't know what it was i was looking at i'm thinking is this really? This was somebody actually took this to a factory and they mass produced it and they, and they were put happy it out with that and, and sold it for ten pound. Ten pound. I'm, like, I'm like looking at it, going, "What happened?" I mean, there was the title screen on the on the Lemon sixty four. I didn't see a title screen when I played the version we had, which is but, really good. Yeah, it's really good title yeah, that, screen. I'm guessing, but that's what I mean. That's 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 back of the case fodder, isn't it? Yes. I just it just shouts, you know, somebody, you know, some. It's just rubbish. It was just rubbish, and it should never have got released. And it's full, full price. It's just goodness me, goodness me. There's some ups. This this is not just. This is beyond Sunday best. This this is a whole new level of Sunday best. This is Adrian. Yeah. I've got you this game. It could be the sequel to Sky <laughs> Once. Have a look at this. It's Sky Twice. See what you think about it. Let me, help you down ah! the, let me help you down those stairs. <laughs> No, no. Yeah, it's that, exactly. It's like you know. Well, Adrian, I noticed that Sky Twice game ended up in the pond. How did that happen? <laughs> Don't know. know, but you'll be in there next to get me some like that. <laughs> Why don't you go try and retrieve it? Yeah, yeah. 
keep going, keep going further back. Oh, it's deeper than it looks, isn't it? Oh, she's not coming out of there. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, so no, just rubbish. I don't even want to think about it anymore. No, no. nonsense. What a what a nonsense. Get lost. What a nonsense. Let's let's move on because that was garbage. Let's move on to our next one. Graham, fancy being a monkey, a wolfman, or a uh, a, li- a lizard? You can I've be. I've been all three. Good. I've been all I'm three. Glad- depends, on, depends on how much Jaeger I drink. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. But uh, tell us about Rampage. Uh, another arcade conversion. Stomps its way through copyright, Bally, Midway. Developer was Software Studios, Catalyst Coders. Creator was Michael J. Archer. David Jolliffe, 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 Jolliffe. Mark Jones Jolliffe. was involved also. And David Wainwright, the producer was Jonathan Dean, Joe Dean, and uh, Joe Dean, Joe Dean. <laughs> it's just too warm in here. And the title screen was by Mark <laughs> Jones. Alex, Mark Jones, Adrian. Mark Jones did the title screen. Musician was Russell Leibly. <laughs> um, so this is a conversion, as I said, of the arcade. Rampage was a 1986 up to three player arcade game by Bally Midway. Players take control of a trio of gigantic monsters trying to survive against onslaughts of military forces. Each round is completed when a particular city is completely reduced to rubble. Warner Brothers, who currently own the right to the property via their purchase of Midway Games, inspired say that this was inspired by monster films. Rampage page spawn five sequels and a film adaptation in 2018 that starred Dwayne Johnson a really crap film Mm -hmm. Um, the arcade for the hardware nuts out there was uh, powered by a Motorola 68000 and a Zylogic a Z80 Z80 and it featured an AD7533 DAC bi-quad filtered midway sounds good soundboard (laughs) whoop-de-doo Um, so as a form of a story I guess such as it is there is one for this George, Lizzie and Ralph have all been transformed into monsters if you didn't get that from what we described at the beginning George is now a giant King Kong style ape I put King King for some reason it's spelled King Kong correctly terrible because of an experimental vitamin Lizzie is now a giant reptile as you say because she swam in a deadly radioactive pond and Ralph is now a giant wolf because of a rogue food additive note to cells don't do the things they did to transform into these horrific beasts as with the arcade the Commodore 64 version can actually be played three players that is quite an interesting thing yes horrific and difficult and nightmarish but an interesting thing <laughs> So that's two joysticks and one keyboard, which sounds like a really dodgy, you know, late noughties video clip that people watch. <laughs> anyway, the less said about that, the better. Lots of, there's lots of reaction videos to two joysticks, one keyboard, I'm telling ah, you. Yeah. <laughs> good, good God. Where's it? Why? Why would you do that with <laughs> that competition pro is never going to be the same. Um, <laughs> um, surprisingly, um, so I'm, I'm, what am I doing? I was going down a rabbit hole there. And I'm not. Uh, um, in this, so in this game, you essentially smash, climb, eat, climb, and smash the buildings and citizens of each city. The game is meant to be set over a period of 128 days in cities across America. So each screen you get to smash is meant to be a city. In the arcade, this is you start again, Peoria, I think, Peoria, Illinois, and ending in Plano, Illinois. We are given mega vitamins at the end of it that turn you back into humans, and then it repeats. That's the arcade. I think I don't know exactly how many levels there are on the C sixty four version. I think I saw a cracked version that where there was a trainer that said you could skip levels, and it said you could skip to level one hundred and thirty two. But I could be wrong. So so there might be one hundred and thirty two levels. I genuinely don't know. You're never really going to know because they all kind of look identical. And you're, yeah. ne- and you're never going to play it for that long to find out. I'll just say that now. I don't know. Anyway, so maybe it happens in the C64 version. You start the game with choosing your monster, and then you all three are dropped onto a cityscape. If you just play one player, the AI plays the other two monsters. You can then shuffle. I'll say shuffle because it's not really like you're walking, is it? Left and no. right. Um, once aligned precisely to the exact pixel identification mark of each building, which is a pain, yeah. um, you can climb the buildings and smash holes in them and grab things from them. Things you can grab in the arcade all actually serve a purpose. In the 64 version, less so, although there is food and things that you can do it. Mm-hmm. But it's not yeah. It's not visually clear enough for you to really grasp what it is. So you just end up smashing the buildings and doing stuff. So, but, so you can eat people and things like that. The backgrounds are a variation of the arcade, and I'm being kind when I say that. So they're not as defined, and the players all look kind of the same shape. In fact, they are the same shape with slight color variations and different heads. They move kind of awkwardly, and the animation is generally poor in this version. You can only punch straight out in the arcade in, in this I say this version because there is a Rampage USA, which I'm going to talk about. But you can, and then the, this version, the UK version, I don't know what you call this one, um, you can punch straight out. But in the arcade, you can punch diagonally too. And you can in the USA version of this, but you can't in this one. Oh, weird. I could. I was doing that. No, no, I couldn't, I couldn't find my way to do it on this one. I could punch down, 
and I'm sorry, I could punch right. I couldn't seem to get it to punch down, but in the USA one, I could. And it had more, okay. any, more animation on the arm as well. Weird. Maybe Weird. I just couldn't get to do it. But the arcade game obviously has more more speed and features around that, including, um, so the, there is a, a lot of the selection screens are a bit, they're not missing, but they're not quite, they're not, oh, it's not all there. The C64 version that we Zap review, the one we played for this podcast, essentially that one. Um, this feels like there's bits not quite there with it. It's not, there's bits missing. Sort of there's, the bits that are important a little bit are the sort of build up to when you start each game, because you sort of, you see a little bit of preamble about the characters. It's just a little bit of thematic that adds to the sort of game because there's not a lot to the game. So you need those some of those little preamble bits. It's only screens. And the Rampage USA version has a little bit more of that. So it has more of those. The characters are less defined in that they're less colourful, but they kind of mm. work better in the Rampage USA version. The game's actually a little bit better. Really yeah, strange. I found it is. That as well. Yes. So the, the Rampage USA version, it's principally the same thing. It's just slightly better variation on the C64. Why and how and who decides these things and whatever, I don't know. So there's a little bit more and some of the selection se- selection screens are a little bit better. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I genuinely don't know why it's, there's differences. I don't know. So it's an approximation, really, this. And for the life of me, I can't understand why it's not better than it is. I know the arcade uses 68,000, so it's, it's like an Amiga chip, really. You know, But... I didn't see a lot of complexity in the actual arcade. I mean, you have three monsters, you're running up and down buildings. We've seen games with three characters in on the C64 running at breakneck speed and mm. on a single background. It's not like the background scrolling or anything else. And I just, I didn't quite understand why it was not quite as good as it perhaps might have been. Now, I think the rea- rationale for all of this, if I boil it all down to something, is that the arcade itself isn't really that great. I know it was quite popular, but it's pretty dull. Mm. So this is yet another one of those dull arcade turned to dull game. And and what, it, what I suppose what you're looking for is well, it's just a, like it's like it's like for like. So a dull game makes for a dull game, no matter how much. And if you take some of the razzmatazz away again, not that there's a lot in the arcade, it's just dull, even duller. So I think this was designed. At the original arcade was designed by somebody that said they wanted a game that had no wrong way to play it. So you just get it and you just put your money in, go and just bash stuff and climb stuff and do that stuff, and that's all it is. That's all good, but that's moderate m- multiplayer fun in a in an arcade, and I think it's diminished. So you know, you're not going. It's not a game you play it for with your mates for a laugh. You, on a one player, it would be really boring. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and this echoes that you play the C64 version. It's dull as dishwater, really. The AI say does play the other roles, but after a while, well, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. That arcade logic of repetitive over and over again works when you have you know, short amount of lives or energy, and you've got and each go costs you ten p. Because the you know your, your risk reward thing, you're putting ten p in to have a go. You know you either run out of money to do that, or you run out of the desire to put money in. When you take that process away, and you're left with just the game as repetitive as this, it's not it's no fun over time. You you could play up sixty levels of this, and w- what are you going to be doing in that sixtieth level that you haven't done in the previous fifty nine? It's just it's boring. It's a boring arcade. Um, I didn't. I never really. Liked, I never liked Rampage or any of its sequels or any of the variants of it. Of I don't think it's very good. I thought the film was crap. So shock or a boring arcade makes boring C sixty four game. <laughs> Yawn. What about you? Exactly the same. A so-so conversion of a so-so arcade game. It's weird how we're on the money with these things. The main hook of this is, of course, playing as the bad guy, stomping and smashing up the buildings and eating people and the like. And I, yes, that, that's a solid premise, but here it's just very slow, lethargic and fiddly to do anything. It's hard to climb buildings due to the perfect positioning needed to get on them. There's no real atmosphere generated by the visuals or sound effects. There's no music to keep things burbling along. I know that's like the arcade game, having tried that out too, but it's where the issues lay. The arcade game was always a good idea, a good idea delivered averagely. This is no different it's a great premise but no fun to play conversions go it's okay but nothing more the three player option is good to see and maybe with more people it becomes a bit more fun but i remember playing this in the arcade with three people and we never wanted to put more than 10p into it before moving on there's just something not right with this it's finicky and repetitive when it comes down to it and all of those problems simply persist into the c64 version and my comment is the same as you if you convert average expect average yep Yep, it, isn't it? You know the yep. the idea of three monsters bashing things it sounds great, Godzilla style thing, whatever, blah blah. blah but just dull. Just do. Well, I never, be careful it, there. He made a point of saying it's not Godzilla. In fact, he he came back from a I think in 2014 or something. He sort of put out like almost like a press release saying, by the way, just to be clear, it's not Godzilla because Godzilla wouldn't have fitted into this game. He's too big. This is actually based on some other Japanese character called something or other. Honestly, you can read about it in the Wikipedia right, entries right. and all that. No, well, I'm just I'm not saying it's like Godzilla. I'm just meaning the idea of Godzilla stomping around and smashing. It's nothing like everything. Godzilla. Remember that. Nothing you, like you Godzilla. Remember, no. Don't upset him. Don't upset it's, him. It's nothing like that other game as well that we played. That Epics one. Um, that was better. That was better. It, it was more interesting. Well, it wasn't great, but it was it was better. Better presentation. Yeah. But this is just yeah. I never was a big fan of Rampage. I think it's all all trousers and no package. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good description, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. This heat's getting to me. Oh, there we go. Rampage. Let's move on quickly. We've got a couple left and then we're done. We're done with January. It's like gone. Let's done. Next up is Zor or XOR. XOR. It's a, it's a binary command. It's a thingy command, isn't it? Coding it's a, command. Well, it's a, it's um, yeah, it's a thingy. It's an opcode, isn't it? No, it isn't. I think it's an opcode, but it's a, it's what's it called? It's boolean, isn't it? It's a, it's a boolean. It's a X. Yeah, X. Boolean logic. Ta- isn't it? X-O, I, I, can't, yeah. I can't remember what it means, but anyway, whatever it is, whatever this is, it's Zor. It's nine pound ninety five, and it's sixty one percent. Why do I seem to get all the BBC Maze game conversions? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I don't know if you like that, and when I just write them out and I forget and I think it, but it seems to be they fall into my lap anyway so what we have here in zor another oversized character based character scrolling game converted from the bbc how many of these did the bbc have oh many many to come <laughs> aside from elite were there any other games on the system that were not maze games or ports from other machines were there i mean fire tracks you want to know ripped off there's loads of them Repton was a <laughs> maze game. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> oh, anyway, Zor. Uh, originally conceived by Paul Carruthers and released by Logotron Recreational Products. There's a, there's a software house there's, to there's stir a, the There's a BBC sounding name for <laughs> you right there. There's a, there's a software house to stir the loins. <laughs> Are you enjoying your recreational product? <laughs> uh, you mean logo. Game. I mean recreational product, damn you. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure who did the C64 version, but here it is anyway. Along with it, it got ports to the Electron, Spectrum, Amstrad, and Atari ST. No Amiga. Poor Amiga owners. Anyway, in Zor, you are charged with navigating the 15 mazes of Zor to reveal the true meaning of Zor, whatever that means. You control characters, Magus and Questor, who are represented by two shields in the maze. I, I was never sure which is which, if I'm, if I'm perfectly honest. I read the instructions, but it was never, never just said. I also said they have powers, but said they have different powers. But again, I couldn't discern what they were, and they were not mentioned in the instructions either. So, like, mad balls. of confusion. <laughs> what? what? The two characters start at different parts of the maze and can be swapped to at any time. So that's what it plays like. When the game loads, you're presented with simple instructions to complete all the mazes and collect all the faces of Zor in each one. As noted, there are 15 of these mazes, all having a different main and they name. And they range from dots and waves to something fishy, all the way down to penultimate and the decoder. <laughs> what any of these means you can attempt any of these um in any order the game is quite open in how you approach it and does let you play it as you want to there's no time limit or anything like that just pick a maze go for it so the aim of the game is twofold you need to complete all the mazes okay, if you've got 15 you need to complete them all completing each maze will give you a letter it's a single letter if you complete collect all 15 letters and unscramble the word then you could send this off to logotron recreational software and they would send you back a certificate and a badge to prove you were a master of Zor. I wonder how long it took for the word to get around playgrounds and if they were inundated with requests for badges and (laughs) and certificates. I don't think anyone ever completed this game. Uh, Well, I think someone probably did. It didn't ask you for any more proof other than the word. So depends how much worth there is in having a a master of Zor badge. uh, Well, maybe the word that you discover is is such such a profound and deep nasty profanity that no one dare send that in <laughs> maybe i only did one i got an l so could be anything logotron probably anyway picking any of the mazes gets you into the gets you into the game the controls are simple up down left and right it's a maze it's a bbc maze game repton uh, all those kind of things just think them and you press fire to switch between magus and questor it'll just be different parts of the maze dotted around the maze are various objects that are dependent on which maze you have chosen so they get harder as they go along there are two types of blocking squares so one is filled with dots and one is filled with waves dotted ones can be erased by moving horizontally through them wave squares can be passed vertically so that's how you get rid of them and they appear in the most awkward of places where you know if you need to you can only move they block you off and things like that's annoying there are in later levels there are also chickens which will move in the direction they're facing until they hit something and these can be pushed up or down so if they're facing to the left you move it up and there's a passage you can lay it down off that chicken will go until it hits something uh, there are also fish which act which will fall sorry if nothing is supporting them kind of acting like boulders in boulder dash so sort of stuff like that there are teleports and bombs too and other blocks that need to be navigated around it's just a maze game there's stuff that happens just things go on and they get more complicated as the mazes progress uh, there are also pieces of the map to find uh, of the maze there are four of these scattered around various parts of the map uh, each discovering each one will show you a quarter of the maze you have collected so you need to collect all four to find to get a full map um on these as well on the map are highlighted in white dots 
the masks of Zor that you haven't collected yet. So you need to find all them. The map is on the UI, which is on the right of the screen. Um, and as the, so it's a black square and that slowly fills in as you collect them. Below the map is the number of moves you have made. And below that, how many Zor masks you have collected. And the total left total sort of that are actually in the maze the left of the screen is where the game plays out and this is the usual expanded character graphic style we have seen in repton realms survivors and probably as i said countless other bbc games the masks to collect uh the comedy variants of the comedy and tragedy masks i believe that's what i thought they were once you've collected them all you need to get to the door in the center of the maze and to complete it you have to be careful, though, as you only have 2,000 steps or moves to collect everything and get out. And although that sounds a lot, the mazes are devious and will take some trying to make it through them, some figuring out. So that's what you've got to do. It's another maze game, albeit with the promise of certificates and badges at the end of it. When I was at school, the thought of a certificate and a badge would have told me all I needed to know about the kids who owned BBC Micros. That's what I thought. <laughs> have I got Blue Peter badges? Yeah. I never wanted a badge or a certificate when i wanted to play my games and it just this stinks of bbc in the here and now there's no real reason to play this unless you must play every bbc maze game on the c64 okay it works i guess the mazes are okay but it's just another bloody maze game from the bbc it looks like one it plays like one it smells like one it is one so if that's for you dive right in but i think the chances of you getting a badge and certificate these days are slim to none 10 pound as well this was 10 pound for a bbc maze game 10 pound graham no not on my it's watch it is. No, that's uh, Zor. I didn't like this. You go around a maze, you collect things. I don't didn't quite understand the two-player logic. Maybe that comes into it later on when there's teleporting and stuff. I don't know. I didn't get much from this. What about you? Did the BBC Model B come with a book called How to Make a Maze Game like Boulder Dash or something? <laughs> I reckon it must have done. I mean, there's a lot of them, isn't there? There's a lot of Repton and Survivors is in the same... And issue that re- of and that realm, that, yeah. Realm and that realm. So, so this it's like a. Th- I suppose it's a. Th- is this a thinking person's survivor? Because. It's the same general kind of thing, scooting around a maze, collecting things. This time you've got two players, not three, that have got different abilities. It's all zoomed in again, yeah. very scoot, very scooty. And and there's already quite a lot of these, isn't there, on, this, on the old yes. BBC. So you know, periodically they do pop up like a, like a poisonous whack-a-mole. I get the sense, though, there was perhaps a, a source code leak somewhere, um, you know, maybe in the school playground at some point. So when you went, here, 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 look at this, BBC discs, anyone? They were like, no, what use are they <laughs> with my system? So, But maybe there was, I don't know, because there seems to be a hell of a lot of this type of game. There's, ever since we saw Repton and whatnot, there seem to be loads of them. It's got mm-hmm. that classic classic bbc game look as well so there's kind of a weird resolution to the sprites and the graphics uh, there's a lot of yellow well they're all um, expanded characters aren't they i think well I, I genuinely don't know with the bbc who knows who cares how they put this together it's just the same as all the others really it's all pretty lame the real lump in the underpants for me was the price for this <laughs> ten, 10 quid Is that at the front or the back <laughs> <laughs> <Bit of both. laughs> um, it's a lot of money for this especially when there's a budget variant in the same issue that was cheaper and probably actually a bit better you know a bit more yeah it probably was yeah they've always the, no they aimed this at the you know bbc i don't know maybe there's something out there for, maybe this is something that people who like bbc games like there might be something for everybody. i think bbc computer lovers and mappers they're very kindred spirits i think they yeah the be. venn diagram is just a circle yeah I, I think it is i don't think there's much you know and it, it appeals to certain kind of person that obviously had a real affinity for the BBC Model B. Outside of the schoolyard, I thought it was, you know, it was nothing if not, um, nothing if not rubbish. Um, so, no. Did you know no, anyone no, no. with the BBC? No, I, had, I knew a few people with an Acorn Electron. I, I, one of the very first computers I ever had was an Acorn Electron, believe it or not. It was a short-lived thing. Um, but um, I know a couple of people that had those. Most people I knew had sort of gone on to Spectrums and there was a few C64 people. And then I'd got, a friend of mine had got a sort of a C64 and sort of showed me the wonders of some of the stuff he was doing. I'm like, that's the one I want. I want that one, none of this. Yeah. And I'd, I'd actually at school, we'd played a couple of the BBC school games that they had because we had back in middle school we had one bbc computer for the whole school and it was like timeshare you know you got it for an afternoon so there was this treasure island type game i remember playing oddly enough many of those games were written and pro- programmed and written by ben daglish and anthony crowther tony crowther <laughs> were they maze they, games yeah well i don't know if they were maze games but believe it or not the the guy who was their teacher got them to do them and then periodically would take them and their family out for a nice slap up meal at Mrs. Miggins Pie Shop, I think. Um, <laughs> well, they used to go out for a nice meal. That's how they got paid. And honestly, that's the truth. The Ben told me that himself. Not enjoy- anyway. He's not enjoying his horse's package. <laughs> <laughs> he's not enjoying his horse's really at all. Anyway, um, as for Zor, well, the only thing that made me Zor was seeing that price. It gave me a Zor ass. it did. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to, you've got to break it. yourself in with some lube, young man. 
Get out of there. Back there. Not so very nice, that. No, not very good. 61% from Zap. I don't know why they were that generous. I wouldn't have been. So. No, the Boolean logic for this is false. That's what I think. <laughs> it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah X off. Is what yeah. Saying, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, as Mr. Miyagi yeah. would not, say. Not Mr. is the, um, is the yeah. my response. Mr. Miyagi programming. <laughs> <laughs> boolean on, boolean off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. That's uh, Zor. It will leave you Zor at that price. It will. Let's, we've got one left. Let's move into it. Graham, tell us all about what it's like playing Risk. Quick game of Risk. Yeah, well, this is not Risk. You know, this isn't Risk, the you know, the military strategy game. This is R.I.S.K. So it's it's rapid intercept, seek and kill is what Risk stands for in this instance. It's a sizzler. DNA in the Scotch could have it to me. <laughs> I know. It's a sizzler. It's, uh, it's yeah. at 90% this. All right. Coded by Christopher West. Graphics by Anthony West. Title screen by Adam West. Not really by Steve Coomer. Um, <laughs> the, the musician was Wally Bebben, or Hagar, as he's otherwise known for some reason. So let me ask you a question, AD. Um, have you heard of the planet Kristen 3? Is that just past Kristen 2? It is. It is, just just south of it. Um, well, you should have. It's a very important place where top men and women, top people, if you will, conduct extensive special weapons research, not the kind of place you want an unidentified alien attack to occur. And yet, this is precisely what happens in this game. And so the scientists, naturally, go into hiding with all of the projects they have been slaving over hidden deep in underground tunnels. What does this have to do with you? Well, as a, uh, a rapid intercept seek and kill order, yes, it's a thing, has been issued. And so you have been sent to the only safe area, home base, again with the DIY centers and the space worlds. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, these, these key military facilities all seem to have a good DIY shop, which I suppose is handy. It just seems, an, you know, branching out and franchising is one thing, but goodness me, Chris on three. That must have been a stretch for their budget. Anyway, it is what it is. Um, fran- so, the franchise, uh, so, it? so, you know, they probably just rang so, up. I'd like to open one on Chris so, on three. Okay. <laughs> all right. Where's that? Can't say, can you Chris on two, obviously. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Um, anyway, so uh, so this this you start on home base, um, and that's your where you, your research. It's one of the research facilities, but DIY center anyway. On the planet, uh, you're in a handy armored hovercraft ship, surface skimmer spaceship. I guess it's they say skimmer in Zap. I don't know that it, it starts as a skimmer, but you can upgrade it so it less skimmy. But anyway, you're in a spaceship <laughs> of vehicle of Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first order of business when you start this game, customize your ship, of course. That's the you know if you're going to kick alien butt in any situation, first thing your uh, skimmer's going to need is a fresh coat of paint. And where else to go than home base for that? Really, if you think that about it, true. that makes no, perfect sense. Doesn't make perfect uh, that's sense. not that's that's not an endorsement. Home base <laughs> is also the place where you can perform repairs and upgrades, and they have a fifty percent summer sale, <laughs> including fifty percent off hooks <laughs> and table lamps and a Texas <laughs> Number Six burner gas barbecue. Just saying, so that's, that's that's genuinely true. That is. Anyway, you can it's also not change an endorsement. the. <laughs> it's not an endorsement. You can also change the border color and other colors. It's all very important. And then, all of, co- of course, that's where you can also access the map and the upgrades. And I'll come to the other parts of the home base stuff. Okay. But at this point, let's get into what you do. So you go to the map, which is a grid that shows alien occupied territory as dark squares and allied territory as well. They look like little volcanoes, really, but little little landscapes. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you've got to select an empty territory, which has got to be adjacent to one of the uh, ones that's free of aliens, and enter the alien controlled sector. The game then sees you in your skimmer navigating the horizontal scrolling world defender style shooting enemy ground vehicles jetpackers baddies there's hostiles everywhere so you've got to kill pretty much everything and there is of course a kill count so you've got to try and kill everything on that level um, and then if you do that well i'll come to that every now and again you'll come across a scientist because even though they're in hiding they're not in hiding they're running around waving at you and um, you can land and allow them to board your ship you can only hold five at a time though unless you upgrade your ship and then you can drop them um you can sorry you can use them as currency a bit later on which is kind of sad and creepy Anyway, um, or you can run them over. I did that loads just for you know for giggles. Yeah, Don't I do that too. though because they're actually useful. They, as I say, they yeah, are yeah. something that you you trade them in for vital supplies. Um, which is is that not people smuggling? I don't know. You know. Anyway. <laughs> Also, there are supply drops you can pick up. They sort of fly at you as you go around. So there's supplies and things that come at you. 
Um, but once you're pretty sure everything is dead, you fly back to the landing pad and enter a tunnel. Uh, remember that I told you earlier that they stashed all the good stuff in the tunnels. Well, that's where you go. So you've got to kind of land on a platform. You, it just flies left to right in one swoop. You don't get any multi-goes multi at this. And you've got to just sort of land on a platform. And you do that, you'll collect what's you know attributed to that particular platform, which can be extra ammo, extra spaceship parts, blueprints even. It's a bit weird, that bit. It's hard it's as well. It's a bit weird. Yeah, it's really hard. hard. I just kept bouncing off them. Do. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's odd. And why, why that? I don't know. Why those things? I don't know. Anyway, so once you done that if you do do it and you can grab some of that um it's back to home base where you can again repair recharge your customized upgrade your ship the currency is the things you've collected so the ammo the scientists the upgrades and the blueprints they're all things that you can trade in to purchase things it all seems a bit mean really why not just have money or something i don't know so uh, you can add extra features like thrusters boosters retros blasters armor cargo shields maintenance droids radar and anti-grav you'll need anti-grav though because it is a bit bouncy without that mm -hmm. um the others do kind of increase the speed you, you turn around and you shoot and all that kind of thing once your ship is all souped up and ready to rock and roll you go back to the map, choose another territory to clear, and so the game goes on. Your skimmer has a damage meter shown at all times. When this when this hits critical, it's game over. So you've got to keep a close eye on that. The main game window outside of home base, which is shown as a mini kind of lab with a lift and computer access, which I thought was more like Argos than home base, is <laughs> um I know weird. Is either the aforementioned map view or the game view. So you've got those kind of main views the main window of the game play it play area when you're in the shooty sort of defendery bit um so at the top you've got your little mini map defender style very similar at the sort of bottom you've got your the main window is you obviously where you're doing all the shooting and scrolling and stuff at the bottom you've got your score your damage indicator your number of rescued scientists the number of aliens remaining and your ammo counter so your ammo is a limited thing so mm. that's how the game plays out that's how it sort of looks on screen that's the sort of vary varying screens it's a good little game actually as a nice looking medium res graphic style, I think it could be argued that it gets a little bit busy and it can be a little bit confusing. Sometimes, I think sometimes the the color schemes blend a little bit when you're shooting about a little bit. But it's I thought it was pretty good, um, and the, it's a style that is later reminiscent of games like Jetpack Joyride. In fact, this reminded me a lot of Jetpack Joyride in those sequences, especially when you were bouncing, mm, yeah, shooting, that, and, yeah. and, the, and the little scientists on the bottom, and it had a little. Yeah. Thing, it sort of reminded yeah. me of that. Um, and it does look the part of this game. The UI and the interface graphics are quite cool, actually. Um, and it has sort of nice ways to add customization to it. As much as it's a bit tokenistic, it is nice that a game does do that. And it does feature so you can change the border color and the schema color and your spaceship color. It's just nice to have something that as pointless as it may be, it is something a little bit extra. Um, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility about how you can make the game feel, which is interesting. It's an interesting thing that it does. Um, and it's it's a simple way of personalizing something. So it's quite nice that. The customizing of your ship is quite a good idea in this. It's a little bit convoluted how it does it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, actual, the way you upgrade your ship is okay, but the way you need to gather things to do it is a little bit silly. That could have been simplified, I think, and just make it so it's easier to upgrade your ship because you need to upgrade that ship because the, late, the later levels are simply crazy. It's the clearly the levels would have been killed. fine. Yeah, I think you could have just, you know, you could have just chosen from some, yeah, I don't know, there's, there's ways that it could have been done better than that. So it's a little bit overcomplicated in that respect. But it does break up the monotony of the game. I think if it was just shooting all the time, Defender style, I think it would be a bit boring. So the fact that you have to land and do those other things does, and customize your ship a little bit, does add little dynamic breaks into the game design, which I think is the really the one thing that prevents this from getting quite boring quite quickly. So you've got a little bit of breaking in the in the sort of main, sort of the play of it all. So the main shoot em up section of the game, the scrolling's fast, there's nothing wrong with that. It's smooth, there's a really nice parallax effect. The graphics there are quite good and varied. Um, it goes from sometimes uh, simple um, skies to other times quite mountainous background graphics. They're all quite well drawn. The nice pixel painting on some of those, quite well shaded. It all runs nice and smooth. The notion that your ship is underpowered at the start, okay. I think it's a bit ridiculously underpowered. I think it's because you bounce around. You're affected by gravity when you first play the first few levels until you get the anti grav. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you're bouncing around really. And again, that's why it felt a bit more like um, Jetpack Joyride in that way. Now, I get it. I get why you do that, but you've got to make sure that that ramping is better. And that's what I, one of my sort of main gripes with this game, as much as it looks nice and it's it's quite a playable game, it needed an easier onboarding and ramp to get you those things quicker so you could you could get into it. And you can make the game more difficult when you do that. So this game gets more difficult because you're underpowered, not because the game is getting more difficult. And I think that's something we've seen in a few shoot -em ups that lean on that, Delta lent on that sort of mentality a little bit. And there's a few of these shooters that seem to start you off with less power than you should actually have. You know, it's, it's silly, really, if you think about it. You know, they announced this risk for this planet, they send someone down there and then send them on a really underpowered ship. It's like sending, you know, what, can I take that space fighter there? No, no, go on a scooter. But surely, <laughs> no, because you can upgrade it when you get there. You know, they've got a home base. Go in there, you can get all sorts of stuff. You get a cheap Texas barbecue and everything down there. 
Yeah, but and that's got like shooty, shooty, you know, zoomies. It's all, all the whiz bangs and woo, I could do everything with that. Nice, nah, get a scooter and upgrade it, you idiot. So it does feel <laughs> a bit like that. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, as it plays out, there's loads of stuff to shoot at. The further you go into this, the levels get frantic with stuff. There's loads of things to shoot at. There's walkers at the bottom. There's yeah. jetpack guys. There's tons of stuff going on. It's a really busy game. So it gets full. And that's really my gripe, it really. Is, is This is that the upgrade tree is a little bit convoluted and it takes too quick. It takes too much time to get there. And I think some people might tire of that very quickly. And that might be the big blocker for them to get into this. But visually, well, it's a nice pixel paint job. Some nice sprite work, good animations all around, really. Although they're quite small, but they're nice. The sounds are good in this. Really good sounds. Mm. Music's good. A really nice intro, Wally Bebb and intro tune. Suits really weirdly melancholy, but it kind of suits this game in a way I can't explain. And the sound effects generally across the board are really good, way above the kind of average pew, pew, pew type of fare. These have got some really meaty sounds in this. I really like that. So it's I found this quite an enjoyable game and it's certainly very well made. And there's enough here to sit it a little bit above just a bog standard defender clone and that will keep you interested because it looks and sounds the part nine quid it's not a bad price i suppose um, for what you get and especially when you place it you know next to the crazy lump in the pants pricing of xor or Zor, whatever it was called or um, sky twice I, or sky twice yeah i think sky twice less. <laughs> oh dear i mean I, I always liked this i had it many moons ago as well this game albeit that it was you know sent to me from the pirate express well, but I did have a copy of this and I did quite like it then, although I could never really figure out what the hell I was doing. But when I finally sat down with this one and got to grips with the, what it was doing and everything else, yeah, yeah, I, I genuinely thought this was all right. Like I said, a couple of gripes and those gripes could be blocker gripes. I, I tolerated them, but I think, you know, maybe mm-hmm. I'm a little bit more forgiving of it. I just wanted to see more of the graphics because some of them are quite neat, but, and I'd love the sound effects and stuff, but I think the upgrade tree and that onboarding ramp being a bit too silly, maybe blockers, but it's all right. A great title from the edge, clearly diversifying aid, even playing guitar with you too. Hats, <laughs> off, hats off to him though. And hats off to home base and God bless Robin Hood. What about you? <laughs> and there we go. That's uh, all the games. <laughs> I don't know what I say. Uh, this is an interesting. I thought it's an interesting strategic evolution of the Defender formula that sees you clearing multiple areas of aliens and upgrading your ship as you go. I thought there was large elements of Whizball in this, in the way that this game. Because yeah, Whizball, there's Whizball, a little Whizball, bit about that. Because Whizball is. Remember at the beginning of Whizball, you need to get your anti grav stuff yeah, left and right, yeah. scrolling, Defender shoot 'em up style. You go back to your home base to mix stuff up. Yeah, yeah. Little, little I suppose there's some borrowings. I think you might be right there. I never thought th- of it, but yeah, yeah you're right, I think. And I think it's, but that's no bad thing because it's. it's it's, I don't, it's not wholesale copying. I think they've, they've looked for it and sort of been inspired by it and gone like, yeah, actually, yeah. we'll take those elements and and warp them, in, you know, change them into our own thing. And I think that's that's quite nice. But I think it's definitely those. I, I was playing. I was like, this feels like familiar. And then I hit on Whizball. The visuals are very nice, as you've noted. The great scrolling, well drawn sprites. I really like the sprites. They're really well drawn. Really nice. Um, I like the, the way the little sort of jetpack men sort of look around around themselves yeah, as they're flying yeah, along. Nice, and nice stuff. little details. Little touches like being able to change the color of your ship and layout and everything through the consoles of your home base and the way they appear is excellent. Um, I mean, this is a game you could almost argue way ahead of its time that, you know, if, there, if this was made now, then you'd be buying cosmetic changes to your home base. Yeah, you know, yeah, be, totally. Them. So that, those building, cosmetic- building it in a pixelated stack or something. Yeah, you'd be, you'd, be buying, you'd be buying this to be microtransactions, new colors for your thing, posters and stuff stick on the wall. That 70, tiny 70, tower 90. game. Yeah, you'd be buying them. So the fact that this is doing that in there you can it's reminiscent of stuff you get today a lot of thoughts been put into this and i think all all aspects of it for me were polished show a great deal of care and attention you are right the bouncy bit in the tunnel is a bit weird you could have done with getting the anti-grab a bit quicker maybe because it's a bit tricky sort of thing. but once you get into it i quite like your, your ability to um approach the uh where you go is you know in any kind of you know you, you're you're not funneled down certain ones you, you know, it kind of opens up it was you know it's kind of like that uh, minter game we played uh, but more approachable what's it mutant yeah, camels yeah. one revenge and mutant camels the second one there's a follow up i think this is worthy definitely worthy of a sizzler i just thought for me i would have liked a smaller ship i think your ship's a bit big yeah a couple of, i noticed a few people said that in the lemon Blurbs. Yeah, I like think it is the, as well. It's yeah. just it's like defenders of smaller ship. If you had a bit of a smaller ship, a bit of a you know whiz, nippier ship, I think that would have been. been but you been, you wouldn't better. have seen the modifications then. True, but you could have built your ship. <laughs> no, up. I, agree, I agree. Yeah, but I agree with you. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, it's that. no, it's no Morpheus with you know it's massive ships like that sort of. But it just felt a bit bit bigger. It's it's not 
quite what sort of one we play like eagles and stuff like that where the ships are a bit bigger that other one yeah so it's it did not need to that be smaller. bad but just a tad smaller would have been a nice i think well yeah because if you think in, in in the scale of relation to the walker things at the bottom and the, some of the other enemies you're way massive like yeah know. exactly that's what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah i agree i think actually good about it yeah yeah aside from that though solid game good one to end on and yeah. i had yeah. i had played it back then i think like yeah, you i got a, a copy of this from somewhere or other um, but I had no idea what I was doing. But having the ability to sort of read instructions and people telling you what to do and kind of understanding it now, yeah, I had a good time. But this was all Same. right. Same. And yeah, uh, good, again, good it's worth it's, what did you think to the music? Because did you listen to it? Because the music actually it gets really good. I it? didn't listen to it all. No, I have to say I didn't listen to it all. But if it's you know what I heard was good. Everything about nothing sort of turned me off. I liked the title screen. I liked the visuals. I liked the sounds. Everything I thought mm, was very. I thought good. this was a really well polished well-presented, well-thought-out game that, you know, screamed attention to detail and that that was th- evident throughout. That's what I thought. I will give the music a listen, though. It's not one I'm sort of familiar with, so I'll, I'll give it a listen later, I think, when I get some time, you know, in, the, in when, when days are 37 hours long, I get some time. <laughs> There we go. Risk, that's the last one we ended on. So we have done, that's it. That's January 1988 done. 30-odd games, ploughed through. In this episode, we looked at Spore, which we liked. We looked at Western Games, which was over-convoluted and stupid. Uh, Mad Balls, which was over-convoluted and stupid. We looked at Chromosome, <laughs> which was a near miss. Yeah, technically awesome. technically good, but lacking in variety. We then looked at Star Wars, which was a strange conversion and not particularly a great one. Then we looked at Sky Twice, which was uh, a, a rear pant bulge. <laughs> um <laughs> so bad then we looked at rampage average is average uh zor which is you know gotta get gotta gotta get that badge and certificate that's <laughs> what you get from playing that game <laughs> indeed and we looked at risk which was really good and we enjoyed risk as a, as a one to end on there's no crap verts i'm afraid adverts are pretty much all right now we've got our chart let's have a look see what's going on in the chart now i think looking at this chart that whoever did this in, in commodore user was had been on the uh christmas sherry's um at number yeah. I'll, I'll tell why in a minute number 10 a new entry is renegade number nine new entry is star wars number eight a new entry is kickstart 2 number seven new entry is shoot em up construction kit uh number six new entry of combat school number five a new entry international karate which i'm gonna get his international karate plus mm. uh down from number one to number four is arcade classics new entry at number three grand prix simulation i think that's grand prix simulator in it but hey ho yeah, uh, yeah from codemasters yeah number two New entry game set match, which we haven't looked at or seen yet. And finally, in at number one, new entry is California Games. Now, we've got Kickstart 2 here by Master Tranic. <laughs> oh, yeah, never know it's that. Oh, dear. 11, new entry is Solid Gold by UK. Number 12, four. We've also got number 13, Soccer Boss by Alternative. It's Football Manager. <laughs> it's not Soccer Boss. That's weird. Why is it, is it, does it say, is it me or am I reading that Star Wars was by Outmark? Uh, yes. Yeah, you're reading Star, Star Wars is by Outmark, yes. What the hell's um, that mean? I don't know. We've also got, um, as Elite got, who did Buggy Boys, that got two eyes in it there. Oh, God. Back to the That's Future by good. Firebird, bubble, 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 world-class leadership. <laughs> <laughs> By Asus, Asus, US Gold. Oh, goodness me, that's terrible. I know. <gasps> Shocking. Uh, on-field football at 18, <laughs> Maca Rhythm Plus. I think somebody had been on the Christmas Shandy. I think someone's definitely been on the, <laughs> on the sauce there, goodness me. <laughs> World-class leadership. I want to play that. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound massively exciting, but you know, let's go for that. <laughs> that and Soccer Boss. Um, probably, I think, but I think it's access manager. in US Gold might have something to say about the IP infringement there with world class <laughs> leadership. Yeah, but it's by Asus, <laughs> not Access. You'll notice. Oh, Ma- Master Tranic makes me laugh. Huh? Master Tranic. <laughs> it's all kind of weird. Codemasters, oh, Grand Prix mate. Simulation. No, they did Grand Prix Simulator. Oh, um, so and, el- bad. and Elite. <laughs> Buggy <laughs> Boy. <laughs> elite. Elite. <laughs> elite. <laughs> Uh, my oh, favorite c64 dear. chart yet i have to say <laughs> yeah it's a good one that one there really is Just me. Um, anyway what we got coming up uh february is another big month it's 33 games i think so it's another four four parter we've got touch joys is 720 andy cap yeah. ah. <laughs> atv simulator uh, it's not the cv simulator of a tv channel <laughs> a tv simulator it is if it's written yeah. by the guy who did the commodore user chart <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it's, it's got, got a terrain vehicle, a, isn't it? <laughs> it's a simulation of an ATV. It's like you've got to do a schedule. You've got to see if it's popular. <laughs> oh, God, I can't put this up. Okay, John, at 6 p.m. You just have to time your uh, raster scan. you just got to be really quick <laughs> as it goes down the CRT tube. Uh, Bad Cat, Beat It. Is this oh, song's off the new um, Michael Jackson album. <laughs> Michael Jackson album. Bone Cruncher, maybe. Bone Cruncher. Clever and Smart. That's gonna. I don't, I've got a horrible feeling that's going to be like Jackal and Wide. Oh God! Don't. Rather than Head Over Heels, Deflector. I remember that being um, quite good. I something just called I. Deja Vu is an adventure, by the way. I yeah. Fire okay. Trap. Okay. Which, I, which we might have already looked at. So that might be a budget release. I don't know. Yeah. Flying Sh- Flying Shark. Finally get mm. the helicopter games. Freddy Hardest. Oh dear. And then we've had Western games. We've had alternative games. Now we've got Galactic games. Oh, no more of these. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Lineker's Superstar Football. Here, Here we, we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, boy. Hey, girl. Gary Lineker's Superstar Football. Here we go. Uh, and we've got Grand Prix Simulation. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Prix Simulator. Uh, Hunter's Moon. Oh, wait a minute. You can't skip Guadal Canal. It's an advent- it's a, it's I know. a uh, It's a strategy game. I don't know. It's just, what a dull thing. Guadal Canal. Just, just no, canal-based <laughs> games for the win. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> true. Well, what was that crap when we played by Rainbird, which you were just flying around brown canals? Oh God, that was um, that was the follow. Was it the follow on? Not follow, but follow on from Star Starglider, wasn't it? it yeah, was it was. What was it? Tracker, Tracker, was it something? I, I, I'll check back through my seventy-page manuals if I can find it. <laughs> then we got I Alien, Inside Out, in Jinx. Oh, Inside now, Out we, was good. I don't think we're looking at Jack track. the Ripper. It's an adventure game, and I can't be doing with them anymore. No, it'll be uh, the whimsy of it all. It is. It's another one of those those CRL Although, ones. Although it? it could be hilarious for its terrible Cockney ramming slang. It could be, but get, I, don't, I, might check it, I might check it out independently. You might do. Uh, Nightmare. Oh, no. Is here. Life Force. <sighs> um, Mask 2. Oh, we might just had Mask. Yeah, if they realised they made a mistake. <laughs> Or maybe it's the uh, sequel to the film with uh, what's his facing Eric Stoltz. <laughs> kind of forgot it was Eric Stoltz in that. It was Match Day Two and mm-hmm. Sheer. Sheer was his mum, I think. Yeah, Sheer was in it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ninja Hamster, which someone was mm. showing us the title screen of that today. I think. Uh, who was that? It was on our Patreon. It was on the Patreon. It was. Uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you why you read out the next one. All right, you do that. You find that out. Uh, out of this world, we've got the conversion of Outrun. Oh dear. Platoon, Psycho Soldier, Ramparts. Uh, then we've got oh, Ven- Ramparts. Ramparts is a, that's a weird Knights in Shining Armor version of Rampage. It is, yes. I know it is. Yeah, yes. I remember that. I remember that. Uh, um, that picture, by the way, was from um, A182 Retro. Ah, uh, cool. One of, yeah. one of our amazing Patreons. It was, yeah, on our Discord. Uh, Vengeance, finally. And another one, Winter Olympiad 88, another multi sport event thing. I'm sure will be stellar. <laughs> oh, another one. Oh, no. The Dead Broncos. <laughs> You just don't get it, Marge. Uh, so that's it. So that's February. February's lineup of games. They will be split over another four episodes um, because it's just too many to get through at the moment and with lives and the heat. I think if I had to play too many of these, I'd just go crazy. Yeah, um, if it was too it many just... Zors, you'd get a Zor, Zor ass, Zor, <laughs> Zor would, hands, Zor fingers. Do. Yeah, I would do. I can't remember. What's, there's a game called I. Just I. I just... Do you know, you can. We start to. We've played so many of these now that as we're reading through that list, you can almost pick out the ones that are going to be shit just by the name. <laughs> probably. I mean, how many how many games have we played now? Up to seven hundred, it must be. Is it? Yeah, uh, probably. Yeah, we must be approaching that. Yeah. So we, we're starting to get to be experts in this. You know, so you know, we could if we could pro- we could probably play a game and pick out the crap, and we'd probably be pretty accurate with it. So let's see. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a mental note of those. I might write them down now somewhere. And then I'm going to review them when we do the next episode and see which ones I can, which I thought would be crappy, which ones actually are. Absolutely. Crap bingo or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a crappy, crap, crappy crap bingo. Cause I have a feeling that bad cat is not going to be a good cat. So I don't we'll think it's going to be that either. And I don't think Andy Cap is going to be good either. Just- no. We just, but you know, we've got to avoid calling it Andy Crap. We've got to think of better puns than that. <laughs> Why? Why would it? Because that's right, that's right there. It's just the low hanging fruit. We've got to, you know, we've got, we, we're better than that. We're better than that. You have no, listened called, to us, haven't you? It, it's, but it's, called, it's, it's like handy crap. You know, it's, that, that's too easy. It's too easy. We've got to think of something better. We've okay. got plenty of time. We've got a bit of time to think of okay. a better pun for how crap that's going to be. Okay. Uh, bandy slap. Anyway, there we go. Uh, that's what's coming up. <laughs> this has been episode, what, 75? 75. Uh, three quarters of the way to 100. And it, well, obviously, yeah. said the maths. <laughs> <laughs>
Golf clap. Golf, golf clap. clap. Golf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Maggie says, X off. To you. X off. X off. X off. Not. Not. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> no. No. <laughs> That's the uh, that's the um, these jokes are getting geekier by the by the second. Yeah, that's, that's the, we're now talking Yorkshire binary, yeah, or Yorkshire <laughs> Boolean logic. No, um. no. Uh, oh god, let's go. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the episode, and you'll be back next week. I have been Adrian Mills. No, yes, I've been Adrian Mills. <laughs> I have been. Oh, golly, it's hot. Graham Raddings. <laughs> this has been Billy from Predator. <laughs> <laughs> what happened uh, to Billy? <laughs> something went wrong. <laughs> Something's gone horribly wrong. Just say it and I'll have to edit it in manually. I don't think, no, we need to leave that. We need to leave all this in. Oh, well, I can't because it, rec- it records them. I'll try and get them out of the channel. That's what, that's what I mean. That's leave weird. It. Why is it doing that? <laughs> <laughs> all this is left in. You have been listening to. <laughs> it's gone wild. <laughs> Billy, what you done, mate? Stop Billy! playing Zor. I told you to stop playing Zor. I knew that would happen. Oh, there we go. Happen. All that staying in. <laughs> You've been listening to Zap to the Past <laughs> and Billy from Predator. And we will see you again next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Zap to the Past podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the world of Commodore 64 games, as well as the music, films and TV from around the 1980s, driven, of course, by the issue of Zap 64 magazine published at that time. We will return with a whole new batch of games and stuff to talk about next week. Until then, if you want to listen to or download previous episodes of Zap to the Past, and why wouldn't you, they can all be found on our website at zaptothepast.com, as well as being available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, Audible, Player FM, and, well, pretty much anywhere where we can upload them. By the way, we do always love to hear from our amazing listeners, so if you'd like to contact us about anything in the podcast or beyond, you can do so by emailing us at zaptothepast at gmail.com. We're also active on Twitter under at Zaptother, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and most social media platforms. Just search for Zap to the Past and you'll find us. Oh, and if you like the podcast and what we're doing, please do like, share, review, rate us. It really helps. Something, apparently. The Zap to the Past podcast is written and produced by Adrian Mills and Graham Ruddings and recorded at Flaky Bits 2.0 Studio. All opinions expressed are those of the writers, and while we indeed love Zap64 magazine, the Zap to the Past podcast is not affiliated with it in any way. Stay safe, see you next time, and remember, we play these games so you don't have to.